Very good morning to everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, Cambridge, uh, to Wolfson College, um, for the second of the James Williams European Legal Dialogues. It's a great pleasure on behalf of, of uh, Cambridge and, and the law faculty to welcome you. Um, we have a, a terrific group of people uh, here, uh, and uh, what I hope is the discussion is going to develop as the day goes on uh, in a reasonably informed way. But first of all, I'd like to um, express uh, our appreciation uh, uh, to the person who's, in whose memory uh, uh, the honour of this series has been started, Professor Sir David Williams, who um, was the inspiration of public law. Uh, founding member, I think, of the European Public Law, um, a, a um, wonderful colleague, uh, a, a great university leader, a former uh, Rasmus Professor of English Law, which, which, which I have the uh, honour to hold now, um, a, 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 a president of this college, Wolfson College, and a uh, a vice chancellor, in fact, in two capacities, a vice chancellor of the University of Cambridge, both being both the last of the old style rotating heads of house vice chancellors and the first of the new style professionalised um, uh, fixed term vice chancellors. Um, uh, uh, and it's wonderful that we can bring together such a distinguished group of people. For, 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 for these events, it was honour, and I, I, it, it's a particular pleasure and honour to have Lady Williams uh, with us as uh, a representative, as it were, of, of, of the Williams family, who, who remain, um, as they've always been, great supporters of, of the college and of the uh, faculty and centre of public law. I won't go around introducing everybody, uh, I, I probably unnecessary. I'll just say that uh, we are going to start with our two um, lead speakers um, and they are going to uh, begin with uh, a longer and short presentation uh, before coffee and then we will break for coffee and then open up the discussion uh, after coffee. Thank you. And, uh, on the principle of ladies first to be yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I am uh, deeply honoured and pleased uh, to be part of this uh, uh, European Legal Dialogue, and I would like first uh, to thank very much uh, Professors uh, David Feldman and Pedro Fogaitis uh, for asking the Conseil d'État to join uh, this year this uh, dialogue. Unfortunately, unfortunately for you, uh, uh, and well, for all of you, uh, the Conseil d'État asked me uh, to, to, to come, and I'm not really fluent in English. And worse, um, as the serious uh, student I was once, I have prepared a week ago, um, uh, carefully, a written paper <laughs> on my personal li laptop. But as the brainless woman I became, um, I forgot my laptop in a cab. <laughs> <laughs> After an epic trip with both uh, a train strike and uh, a traffic control strike at the same time, uh, well, strike are uh, probably a uh, French uh, second best specialty uh, <laughs> after, of course, the uh, judicial review of uh, administrative action. So, uh, anyway, so no more paper anymore, and uh, no more PowerPoint. I've done something quickly, too quickly, probably, uh, and I will do my best. But uh, mm -hmm. please forgive all the crimes I'm about to commit against English grammar. I'm, I'm really sorry for that. Okay, so uh, let's start. Um, as a French also working for the Conseil d'État, it is hard to say it without uh, looking full of sufficiency. Uh, but the French have invented one of the main models of uh, judicial review of administrative action. It's a model that all of you uh, know very well, and uh, I, want it I want to present it, uh, but I will try instead to share with you some of the thoughts 
that the questionnaire distributed uh, before uh, our meeting inspired, inspired to me. Uh, not about the last topic, because I think the last topic of the questionnaire is probably a, a kind of conclusion of our work today. Uh, so uh, I will wait to hear all of you uh, before I uh, discuss it. But I will try to uh, give you some ideas uh, of, from a French point of view on the, the other uh, topic. Uh, I just want to precise first that unlike some of my colleagues, uh, I do agree with Jean Rivero, uh, a very famous French professor uh, of administrative law, when he wrote that the French model is not a prototype, uh, it's an archetype. Uh, and uh, uh, it means that the, uh, the, it is not something that was duplicated in other countries. Uh, but probably uh, uh, an extreme expression of a certain idea of a, a judicial review and quite uh, uh, solitary. And that uh, starting point doesn't mean that you, can, uh, you can't find some aspects of that system in other countries, but those aspects won't probably have the exact same signification, uh, mostly because all of those aspects have strong links with French history, uh, which is obviously unique. Sorry, yeah, yeah, of course, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I should have prepared you some, you know, slide. Um, okay, um, and what is important is uh, that the French system is not linked only with the history since the French Revolution, uh, but also uh, with what we call the Ancien Régime uh, history. Uh, Contrary to what is usually uh, said, uh, Napoleon did not create the Conseil d'État out of nothing. He just modernized the Conseil du Roi. Uh, uh, and the Conseil du Roi was the legal advisory and a judge for administrative matters for the French kings during centuries. And it even took the name of Conseil d'État during the reign of Louis XIV. And this is, in fact, a picture of uh, Louis XIV's Conseil d'État. So I know that the questionnaire uh, is about today, the judicial uh, review uh, of the administrative action, but this is impossible to understand, I think, some of maybe specific aspects of the French system without uh, uh, this historical background. So I will probably give you some old ideas. Uh, OK. Um, that is precisely the case, I think, for the first uh, topic. Uh, the the uh, idea of uh, uh, the context of separation of powers. Because as a matter of fact, the separation of powers is a sort of starting point uh, for, to understand the judicial review in the French system. Uh, not any kind of separation of powers, but what the Conseil Constitutionnel uh, called the French conception of separation of powers. Uh, in the, the case uh, Conseil de la Concurrence in 1987, uh, for the very first time, the French con constitutional judge established the existence of an administrative judge uh, as a constitutional uh, protection with the monopoly <coughs> uh, of the ju judicial review of acts of public authority. And the justification of this is the, the French conception of separation of powers. This conception was expressed in two main uh, texts of the revolutionary period. It is the uh, parliamentary law of the 16th and 24th August uh, uh, 1790 <laughs> and uh, the uh, um, executive order of uh, 1640, I think there is no translation for Fructida, uh, year three, uh, which is in fact uh, 1794. Those uh, two texts say basically the same thing. It's the idea that because of the separation between the executive power and the judicial power, it is forbidden for the judge uh, to know any cases related to executive matters. Only an authority that is a part of the executive power can review it. And that's why we create a Conseil d'État. But uh, let's be maybe more specific about uh, the causes, the reason of this French conception of separation uh, of powers, we can probably identify three main reasons for this uh, specific conception. 
The first one, uh, pointed out by Tocqueville uh, in his uh, fundamental book L'Ancien Régime et la Révolution, published in uh, 1856, is that France, in fact, knew uh, a judicial review of administrative action very soon in its history. Uh, it was done by the parliaments of the Ancien Régime. In fact, the, the parliaments before the revolution were the uh, uh, high courts of judge justice. And um, those parliaments, uh, those courts of justice, were very active, uh, full of noblemen, not very, um, well, uh, not very uh, okay with the royal authority, uh, let's say that in that word. And those courts, uh, in fact, wanted uh, to be more like the big British parliament. So they were very active and not uh, very supportive uh, to uh, some of uh, the, the king action. That's why uh, the French revolutioners were very suspicious uh, to the, the court of justice and they were fe fearing that the courts uh, will, uh, could uh, stop uh, the reforms. So that's why they uh, forbidden them to know uh, administrative matters. Uh, the second reason uh, is both a theoretical and political uh, point of view very, very common, I think, in French uh, doctrine, and it's expressed by the adage, juger l'administration, c'est encore administré. Uh, I can maybe translate it, uh, judging the administration is still administrate. Um, politically, the starting point is that public interest is above individual interest. And the idea is that only a judge who knows very well the executive power can make uh, the balance you have to do between public interest and citizens' rights. And this point of view is still very much alive, uh, even if uh, since 20 years citizens' rights are uh, becoming more and more important, and I will talk about it later. <coughs> um, the third reason, uh, not the easiest one to explain, uh, was pointed out by Professor Michel Tropper, and it is known as judicial syllogism. Uh, it is one well that Montesquieu uh, wrote that the judge can only be mouth of the law. I'm not sure that means anything in English, but uh, uh, it means that uh, the, the role of the judge is only to apply a law written by the parliament. But in France, there was very soon uh, uh, a civil code, there was very soon a written criminal law but it was no written administrative law. And if you don't have written law, you can't have a judge. So you need, well, something else, <laughs> somebody else, uh, to control the executive power because you need to write the law while you control it. So it was uh, probably the third reason. Uh, let's move to maybe a more modern point of view. Uh, as I told you before, the French uh, conception of the separation of uh, powers is still very much alive, uh, theoretically. Uh, at least, uh, it is still the rationale for administrative justice. But I must confess that uh, we are in uh, real life uh, very far from this conception in many ways uh, since the 90s. Two examples to prove that point. Uh, first, the judicial review of the law, the parliamentary law, I mean. Uh, for almost two centuries, uh, the Conseil d'État refused it to discuss the parliamentary law in the name of separation of, of powers. But for many reasons I don't have the time to develop here, uh, this is over. The administrative judge is doing almost every day judicial review of the parliamentary laws, uh, regarding to European and international law uh, since the Niccolo case uh, of 1989 and uh, since uh, uh, the, the reform of the Constitution uh, in uh, uh, 2008, uh, the Conseil d'État is now a major actor of the constitutional judicial review with the QPC uh, mechanism, which is a priority preliminary ruling on the constitutionality of the law. The second example that proved, <coughs> sorry, that we are uh, maybe unconsciously over the French conception of separations of power is injunction. 
Uh, given injunction to the executive authorities uh, had, has never been prohibited by uh, a law, but the Conseil d'État had always considered that the separations of power uh, forbidden such a thing. Since the parliamentary law, anyway, of the 18th February 1995, the administrative judge can order the administration to adopt a specific enforcement measure. And it can even order a periodic penalty payment until the authority adopts the enforcement measure. And it is not seen as a problem anymore. Uh, so I think that the French conception of separation of power uh, is, is still justified the existence of a special judge, but it is no more a limit for its review uh, of the uh, public authority. Few words maybe now about the uh, second uh, topic, and uh, let's uh, start with uh, what I think is quite specific in the French divided uh, jurisdiction system. The division of competencies between the administrative judge and the judicial judge uh, is incredibly complex. I'm teaching administrative procedure law. Uh, to uh, third year uh, students. And uh, I spent at least uh, six hours trying to expose these divisions of competencies. And I, I don't, I promise, I don't give details. I, I just uh, outline the main elements. So I won't even try to explain it now. <laughs> uh, but I believe that, <coughs> generally speaking, uh, the French administrative uh, jurisdiction have a more extensive field of competencies than the other administrative church uh, in Europe, even in countries uh, with a tradition of divided uh, jurisdiction. Its competencies uh, cover not only individual and regulatory administrative acts of central government, of a central agency, of local authorities, of public institution, well, every, almost every public institutions. Uh, but uh, they are, uh, uh, it includes also uh, public contracts. Uh, it includes uh, all the matters about civil service, administrative responsibility, etc., etc. And no matter if the case uh, implies administrative law, civil law, criminal law, uh, competition law, whatever, it's totally irrelevant uh, to define these competencies. There are, of course, historical uh, reasons to explain that extensive field of competencies, but I would like to point out two other uh, reasons, uh, maybe, a specific one in France. And the first one is the role of the tribunal de conflict. This is the place where uh, the meetings take place. In theory, uh, the tribunal de conflict, who, who was created in 1872, to solve the problems uh, uh, due to division of competencies between the, the two jurisdictions. Uh, <coughs> In theory, this uh, tribunal de conflict is a, is a joint body uh, because half members are coming from the Cour de Cassation and half members are coming from the Conseil d'État. <coughs> but particularly, and please don't say that uh, to any uh, French uh, judge, <coughs> uh, practically the Conseil d'État dominated. Uh, not only because the meeting or uh, uh, in uh, the Palais Royal, in the Salle des Conflits, and not only because the Conseil d'État always uh, sends uh, its best and most experienced members uh, to the Tribunal des Conflits, whereas the Cour de Cassation sends often uh, newbies, uh, but mostly uh, because the concepts uh, <coughs> used uh, uh, to distribute the competencies between the two jurisdictions are public ones and they have been invented by the Conseil d'État, so well. Uh, the second uh, explanation, uh, it's uh, probably the Conseil d'État itself. Uh, one uh, mustn't forget that the Conseil d'État is not only a judge, but also the legal advisor of the government. And this is the picture of the Salle de l'Assemblée Générale, where every uh, Thursday uh, the Conseil d'État examines a uh, government uh, project. And that very unique and very strong position, I must say. <laughs> uh, and also the fact that many members of the Conseil d'État 
uh, spend part of their career in what we call in French the uh, active administration. Um, all those elements uh, reinforce uh, the influence of the Conseil d'État, especially when it needs uh, to protect its competencies. Uh, that brings me to the next uh, point. Um, uh, di divided uh, jurisdiction is not in France only a question of divided <coughs> competencies. Uh, the judicial judges and the administrative ones are living in two different worlds. Uh, on the one hand, uh, you've got the judicial judges. They all come in from a, a school called uh, École Nationale de la Magistrature, and they are all forming uh, a, a single uh, corps. Um, and they will all spend all their career in, uh, as, as judge. Well, different position, but always as judge. On the other hand, you've got the members of the Conseil d'État. Uh, they are not in the same corps of the judges coming from tribunal administrative and uh, administrative court of appeal, two different corps. Uh, but the members of the Conseil d'État are coming from another school, uh, l'école nationale d'administration, uh, and uh, they are uh, civil servants, but they will serve in the Conseil d'État and in other positions in the administration. Uh, so those very different uh, background and career explain that uh, you have um, two really different uh, cultures, I think, between the judicial uh, uh, jurisdiction and the administrative one. Um, I will just give you one example <coughs> of that difference of culture, and uh, this example uh, allow me to skip the third topic of the questionnaire. Uh, but we can uh, discuss uh, about it later. It's the question of independence. For the judicial judge, uh, independence is individual. That is to say, any judge can do what wants. Well, within certain limits, of course. But it means that there is no discipline. Uh, that, for example, the different uh, chambers of the Cour de Cassation uh, adopt sometimes different solutions on the same issues. And, well, it's quite common. Uh, it's also very common that a court of appeal, that a court of appeal uh, uh, does not follow the court de cassation uh, case law. It's quite common. All those things are absolutely not conceivable within the administrative jurisdiction, because for the administrative judge, independence is something collective. Uh, the important thing is that the political authority, and especially the executive power, cannot interfere in jurisdiction matters. Uh, and uh, especially towards the executive uh, power, uh, it was a, 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 a serious battle uh, during almost all the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. And finally, the Conseil d'État win it, but it was not easy. Um, but within the administrative jurisdiction, there is a very, very strict discipline. And I think mostly because of the importance of equality in uh, French public law tradition. Uh, regarding to that principle, one must always have the same uh, judgment, whatever judge is in charge of his case. So that's why we are uh, uh, very strict with that discipline. Uh, last thing I would like to say about uh, divided uh, jurisdiction in French is that it is curiously still uh, an issue uh, for some people. Uh, for decades uh, it seems not to be, but during the last three or four years uh, this issue arises again. There were uh, some attacks, uh, especially but not only from the first president of the Cour de Cassation, Bertrand uh, he protests several times against the importance of the administrative jurisdiction in the field of civil liberties. Whereas uh, the Article 66 of uh, the French Constitution uh, claims that the judicial authority is the guardian of the freedom of the individual. This debate is mostly linked to the state of emergency uh, law which applied uh, since the terrorist attacks of uh, 2015 to the end of 2017. 
And under that law, uh, some measures that usually are uh, measures, measures uh, taken by a judicial uh, authority, like a search or house arrest, are taken by the executive power under the eye of the administrative judge. And that was, I think, the main uh, difficulty. Now that the state of emergency is over and that Mr. Louvain is almost retired, uh, the issue seems to be less controversial, but it proves that there are uh, recurrent tensions between the two jurisdictions in, in France even, even today. Okay, so as I told you, I will skip, uh, uh, I'm skipping the third topic and I'm finally finishing with the fourth. Uh, so this is a picture of the website of the Conseilita. <coughs> Uh, the, the English uh, version of the, the website of the, of the Conseil d'État. Uh, so one can assume this is how the Conseil d'État wants to be uh, introduce itself to, to the rest of the world. Uh, as, as you can see, uh, uh, it's, uh, it clearly wants to be seen as the champion of uh, uh, protection of uh, citizens. Let's see those uh, statements. Uh, but this is very new. Uh, for the Conseil d'État. In fact, uh, the Conseil d'État has totally changed uh, its approach in the 90s. Uh, until that uh, time, uh, priority was clearly uh, given to the administrative efficiency. Um, this is, uh, of course, uh, well, this, this is a part of the, probably the DNA of the administrative jurisdiction uh, and the reason why it was created. Um, and this uh, quote of the uh, President uh, Pierre Nicolai, who was uh, vice president, means president of the Conseil d'État in 1985, and it was an interview given to uh, Le Monde, so the most uh, serious people in France. Um, and uh, uh, it, it illustrates that, that <coughs> traditional philosophy uh, of the uh, Conseil d'État. Uh, saying that in a dispute between uh, the administration and a citizen, uh, there are in fact three in the court. The administration, the applicant, and the public interest. And everything is said, I think, with that uh, statement. But uh, things are uh, changed in the end of the 80s. Um, I think first because the French administrative judge uh, reconnect uh, with the rest of the world. Um, and second, because uh, it, took, it took into account deep changes in French society, uh, and especially the end of the omnipotent welfare state and the uh, triumph of individualism. So uh, the, the administrative judge uh, started to uh, look the petitioner uh, very differently. Um, and uh, uh, Professor uh, Jean Vivero uh, wrote uh, two, uh, I think, masterpieces in, in French uh, law literature uh, about uh, Huron uh, chief uh, visiting uh, the Conseil d'État, and uh, uh, it, it was a kind of, you know, like the Persian letters, but uh, for the administrative <coughs> jurisdiction. And he pointed out the weakness of the French administrative justice. And I think it was finally uh, heard, but probably in the 90s, uh, when he said, uh, as the tomahawk is made for war and the sacred pipe for peace, the administration is made for the citizen and the justice for the litigant. But that's very uh, new uh, for the Conseil d'État to consider things that way. It, it was really a, a, a cultural revolution for us. And it brings, uh, of course, many, many changes. Um, uh, a student that uh, fell uh, asleep in the 20s and woke up in 1990 uh, wouldn't have been really disturbed because it was almost the same thing. Uh, but since the 90s, this is the awakeness of sleeping beauty. I'm sorry, I've got three daughters, so um, I'm interpreting <laughs> all those fairy tale uh, stuff. Um, but since the 90s, uh, there were numerous changes, uh, all in order to improve uh, the judicial protection of citizens. This is uh, the main goal of all these uh, changes. It leads to uh, limit to a minimum the administrative act that can escape 
from judicial uh, review. Uh, it leads to deepen the control uh, on, on uh, the act, uh, to explain more carefully in the decision the why, um, and it leads to give uh, to the judge new powers. Um, and according to me, the most important uh, of those new powers uh, was bring with the parliamentary law of the 13th June uh, 2000. Uh, this law was carefully uh, prepared and in, in fact written by the Conseil d'État uh, itself and then delivered to the parliamentary, which was nice enough to adopt it. Um, it is well known that the te text was uh, mostly inspired by the uh, former president of the section du contentieux uh, du Conseil d'État, Daniel Labotou. Before that law uh, existed, the possibility for the French administrative judge to suspend the execution of an administrative act. But the conditions to do uh, so were so restrictive that it was never used. And uh, uh, it is uh, also not in the French uh, tradition uh, that was marked by what we call the privilege du préalable. Uh, it means that the administration has the privilege of having its decision enter into force even if uh, they are challenged. Uh, because uh, there is a sort of presumption that administrations are act are legal. Uh, that's why this uh, parliamentary law uh, may be seen as a Copernican revolution. It created uh, entire new procedures, allowing the urgent application judges to take provisional measures when the urgent uh, nature of the case uh, justifies them. And uh, because those procedures have proved their uh, efficiency over the years, they have become slowly very common. Uh, they have recently become parts of uh, administrative judge uh, everyday uh, life. And that brings uh, deep changes. I won't uh, say everything, but uh, uh, let's say that um, um, it is one thing uh, to uh, say uh, the legal truth uh, ten years after battle, to be of uh, a kind of uh, uh, a wise uh, wizard uh, uh, in its uh, tower, uh, respected but not really listened to. And it is an entire different thing to be in the middle of the battle, uh, to give order that have immediate uh, and uh, fully, that have, that have to be immediately and fully respected. Uh, so the administration uh, changes uh, his way of uh, looking at the administrative judge. And this new respect uh, leads to another kind of dialogue between the administration, the judge, and the citizens. Um, I think that uh, the Burkini's uh, case is a quite good example of that uh, new part for the administrative judge. Um, maybe uh, you know about that case because it's so French that the foreign papers uh, were very interested in it. <laughs> um, during the uh, summer uh, 2016, uh, there was a huge political debate about the Burkini, uh, these uh, bath foods that some uh, Muslims, uh, women but not only Muslims, are wearing to hide their body while swimming. And some mayor in the uh, southeast of France uh, had decided to forbid uh, these uh, swimming suits on their beaches. An association, an individual citizen, asked for this decision to be suspended. Um, and the urgent application judge of the Conseil d'État uh, orders in the same summer, so in a very short uh, period of time, uh, orders the minor's decision to be suspended, uh, mostly because there was no evidence that uh, safeguarding pieces and good order on the beaches uh, needs uh, those kind of uh, uh, measures. <coughs> and uh, well, liberty is still the rule, so uh, you have to explain when you uh, forbid something. Um, and those uh, uh, application of the of the the urgent application urgent decision uh, closed more or less the debate. Uh, there was. Uh, a few proposals of making parliamentary law on that specific topic, but well, mostly the order brought back peace on this uh, very explosive and sensitive uh, matter, at least for, for a while. Uh, 
What is very interesting is that the administrative judge uh, was not only a very efficient uh, uh, protector for the citizens' uh, rot in that case, but it was also a player uh, of the uh, uh, sensitive political uh, debate. And this is, of course, in a way very interesting, but it also can be a quite a dangerous road because, uh, of course, it puts the judge in a very exposed uh, uh, position. So this is probably the new challenge uh, for the uh, French administrative uh, judge in the years to come. Uh, thank you for your attention and I'm very sorry for my poor English again. <laughs> from the European group. Uh, your English is probably better than mine, Maria, as we're going to be here, so don't, oh no. don't, don't, don't worry. Um, I, I propose to approach it slightly differently. So I, I looked at the questionnaire and I did think probably I could do a short or a longer presentation on each of the discrete issues. So what I think I'll do instead, I was going to say with your approval, it, it's what I'm going to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> is uh, I'm going to take the issue of the duty to give reasons for administrative decisions and judicial review in the context of the duty to give reasons for administrative decisions and use that to bring together some of the themes in the questionnaire, mainly from uh, themes three, four and five. Um, in theme three, in the questionnaire, you'll all have looked at, at uh, the questionnaire, so in, in uh, theme three, there is a question of how far judges should have, if you like, an inside understanding of the administration. Um, that is something that I think is relevant to the question of the duty to give reasons. Um, and theme four is the tension between uh, administrative efficiency and the protection of the individual. Uh, Mary also mentioned the broader public uh, interest. That, that, that's another feature of that, and I think the duty to give reasons is illuminating there. Uh, and the fifth one, I'll, I'll dip my toe into the conclusions, <laughs> uh, because the issue of the duty to give reasons, I think, factors into broader issues of administrative procedure, where the reference to Professor Craig's work on European administrative law and global administrative law, I think also has something to do with the duty to give reasons. But we'll see. I've also chosen the duty to give reasons uh, for two further uh, possible benefits. One is our common law approach to the duty to give reasons as we understand it, certainly with comparison to EU law, is, is different. We have historically said there is, I'll talk about the different ways in which there can be a duty, but at common law, uh, historically and contemporaneously, there is no common law duty to give reasons unless the courts decide that there is a particular contextual factor that, that, that compels it. The way we teach EU law, we may be wrong. We're leaving the European Union, so I suppose it doesn't matter if we're wrong. <laughs> um, EU law would expect reasons to be given unless there was some reason why they shouldn't be given. So it's <coughs> one of very much there's been a, a disjunction between the common law and, and, and the call it the European Union. Um, and the third, or sorry, the second uh, benefit from looking at this uh, there was a decision of the UK Supreme Court in December of last year. Uh, I'll call the case Kent and Dover. Um, it's, a, it's a longer citation than that, but I'll call it Kent and Dover because it, there are some very interesting points within it. I don't know if you know the case, but there are some very interesting points within it uh, about the values that underlie a duty to give reasons, a common law duty to give reasons. And I want to point to those. Uh, in relation to uh, theme five and see how far they uh, can be identified in their systems. Let me start, I apologise to David and anybody from the common law system, let me, let me start by saying a few words first of all about the duty to give reasons in the UK system, I'll call it the UK system, uh, and then I'll, I'll go to um, the Kent and Dover case. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, I, I wrote this, I said the following points are uncontroversial, which probably means that they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, but here's the first one that's probably wrong. 
because I've said there are four, and then I put in brackets, or two ellipses, or maybe five if Gal is factored into ellipses again. But I'll say there are four ways in which there can be a duty to give reasons for a decision. Um, I'll explain the two point in a second. Uh, first of all, under statute, statute uh, may either primary legislation enacted by, for instance, the Westminster Parliament, or subordinate legislation may impose a duty on a decision maker to give reasons. Uh, it could be a planning authority, it could be a government minister, um, tribunals in the run over to, towards judicial functions, there's a duty to give reasons. So there can be a statutory duty to give reasons. Uh, secondly, under EU law, there can be a duty to give reasons. Uh, forgive me if I'm wrong in the way I position this. Under directives, for instance, the Environmental uh, Impact Assessment Directive, uh, which has a crossover with the Aarhus Convention, which is where I think there's potential scope for discussion of European procedure and, and global procedure, but I'll come back to that. Uh, so directives. Uh, there can be a general principle in EU law to require reasons and of course under the Charter of Fundamental Rights Article 41 uh, the guarantee of good administration can require reasons. Uh, the European Convention, it's actually sometimes a little bit under appreciated in our system I think how far the European Convention can give rise to a, a duty to give reasons. Uh, uh, okay, Article 5, if somebody's arrested, they have to be informed of the reasons and the charge. That's one aspect. Article 6 in the judicial context. But if one goes to, for instance, Article 2 and uh, the right to life, and where the state is involved in action, so let's say the police are involved in action that leads to the loss of life, uh, uh, it used to be in, in our system that the, the director of public prosecutions, if he or she directed that there should be no prosecution. They didn't have to give reasons. Uh, the European Convention would now say, well, there's an adjectival aspect to Article 2. You must give reasons uh, because of the interest of transparency, uh, etc. Um, and Article 8, actually, I'll put Article 8 in my back pocket and come back to for another point uh, later on. <coughs> so that's the third. And the fourth is the common law. And the common law, judgment law, of course, the courts, there is no common law duty to give reasons unless, the courts typically say, unless fairness, that uh, Mercurial can mean everything, mean nothing, unless fairness requires that reasons be given. Kenton Dover, I think, has gone beyond that quite uh, obviously, and I'll come back to that. So those are the, the sources. The reason why I said four and then I said two, uh, because if you go back to a very purist constitutional approach, you would say, well, EU law and the European Convention are ultimately statute law because they have to but that's, anyway, that was in parenthesis. I'll leave that one. Um, threshold, if there is a statutory duty to give reasons or if there is a common law duty to give reasons, the threshold requirement that the courts put down is that the reasons must be proper, adequate and intelligible uh, in their context. And I think that's where there's some, I, 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 I'm, sorry, I'm sad that Sir John is not here, I'm also relieved that Sir John is not here because uh, Kent and Dover, when it was in the Court of Appeals, Sir John gave judgment in it, so I was in a state of high anxiety because I thought, oh my dear. Um, but one question I did want to ask Sir John is how the courts genuinely approach that question whenever they're looking at administrative decision makers or local councils making planning determinations. Uh, how far do they genuinely you know, is that a really hard-edged standard of review whenever they look into an administrative decision-making process? And I think that's related to the question of how far <coughs> the judges in the United Kingdom do or should have an understanding of administrative uh, processes. But anyway, they must be proper, adequate, and intelligible. Um, in our case law, uh, Sir Stephen Sedley, who of course is one of the most distinguished members of the European group, Sir Stephen Sedley in a judgment quite some vintage now, a case called the Institute of Dental Surgery. He, it's still one of the most cited judgments on the duty to give reasons, and he said, in, uh, the, uh, on the one hand, if you, if you require people to give reasons, difficulties with that may be, you require unanimity from the decision maker, where there may have been a diversity of opinion. Um, you may require people to try and put a, a hat on what are essentially on inexpressible value judgments. 
Um, and he also, there's, this, there's a nice phrase, I like this phrase, he says, it can offer an invitation um, to the captures to comb the reasons for previously unsuspected grounds of challenge, which is a nice judicial way of saying troublemakers will look for anything they can find uh, with which to bring a challenge. Uh, but you'll know then, the flip side of that is a duty to give reasons concentrates the mind of the decision maker requires them to point. And that's where you start to get a, a, a straddle between procedural aspects of judicial review and substantive aspects because uh, reasons would be a procedural obligation, but of course it reveals potential substantive weaknesses in a decision and uh, opens uh, the possibility of judicial review. Um, the question I referred to rights, um, I would be reluctant to talk about the tension between uh, administrative convenience or administrative efficiency as against rights because it's not just rights, it may be something softer such as an interest, it may be the public interest as we'll see with Kent and Dover. Um, but of course if rights are affected by a decision um, then the common law requirements of fairness will, will, will kick in, that, that's associated with Still one of the leading cases, a case called Duty, which was on uh, setting tariffs for life sentence prisoners and the role that the, sec the Home Secretary then played, not anymore. Uh, the Home Secretary was required by the House of Lords to give reasons for putting somebody in prison for a minimum period uh, of, of time. Uh, again, of course, if you flip that over, uh, in rights cases there can be very compelling reasons uh, for limiting, let's say the interests are not interest for limiting the requirements of good administration, national security. So of course we've had recent cases in the context of anti-terrorism measures where, for instance, Article 41 was pleaded and where, for instance, the court said, well, actually, national security, of course, trumps uh, such requirements, can trump such requirements. Uh, in the common law, uh, uh, this is where Article 8, I'll take Article 8 back out of my pocket and put it on the table, uh, because in all of the debates, every, everybody's had these debates in every legal system, Europeanisation, well, that was 20 years ago, but everybody talked about Europeanisation and how we can learn from European law and European standards. This was one of the areas in which the common law uh, reflected and said, well, would the common law benefit from adopting an approach that was more uh, akin to the European approach? good example of this again, uh, Sir Stephen said, in a case called Wooder and Fegeter, which was about uh, the compulsory administration of medical treatment to a person in a mental health facility. Uh, and in that case, uh, Sir Stephen talked about the frailties of the common law approach and hinted that really people should be given reasons as a, as a right rather than a matter of uh, grace or fairness. Um, let me say a few words about Kent and Dover, and then I have three suggested questions for, for discussion, which uh, you can, of course, uh, take or leave. Uh, Kent and Dover, a uh, ruling was given, as I say, in December 2017. It was a case in which a planning application had been made to a, a local council in the south of England. It was a, a planning application with very significant economic benefits for the area, uh, in terms of creation of jobs, building of a large number of residences, a hotel. But the area in question was an area of outstanding uh, natural beauty, so, of course, income as the environmental impact assessment directed from various requirements. The application came in, a planning officer had a look at the application and said, well, okay, you could grant planning permission, but you would have to reduce the number of houses that could be built. Um, I'm, I'm going to suggest that you don't have quite so expansive uh, a planning process. That went to the, the committee in the local council, and it said, mm, uh, we'll, we'll grant permission essentially on the terms in which the application uh, was made and they didn't give reasons for uh, that decision. Uh, Lord Carnworth gave a judgment on behalf of the Supreme Court, uh, all of the other justices agreed with him and he basically said if you have a situation where a local council is advised by one of its officers not to uh, grant planning permission on the particular terms that have been, uh, or in the terms in which the application has been made, uh, and then they ignore that advice and do grant it. He said, what is the uh, nature of the duty to give reasons? And the interesting point, this goes back to theme five, the interesting point was he said, is the duty to be found in statutory sources, uh, European or domestic, or in the common law? So go back to our, where you, the duties can come from. Is this a statutory duty to give reasons in this case? Or is there a statutory duty to give reasons in this case? 
And in any event, would there be a common law duty to give reasons? Bearing in mind that the common law classically only requires that reasons be given where fairness would demand. Um, and what are the legal consequences of a breach of that duty? That's one of the questions that I would like to uh, ask people's views on. Now, um, in the judgment, it, it, it divides up, uh, Lord Cormothy goes through the, the statutory uh, schemes, of the, the duties were all found in secondary legislation. There was, a, there was a discussion about, well, is the duty to give reasons uh, the same across uh, all of the statutory schemes? Push comes up, he concluded ultimately that essentially the same test applied and he said that the environmental uh, impact assessment legislation was relevant and that reasons should have been given on the basis of the environmental uh, impact assessment legislation. But he went on and he said, notwithstanding that, let me have a look at what the common law would require in this circumstance. And he made four points, well he made four points in that, he made four points that I could suggest and which I'm going to um, put out. He reiterated, he said, public authorities, they have no general common law duty to give reasons for decisions. So the starting point in the common law remains, uh, I'll query if this ties up with some other parts of the judgment, the common law position remains, if a public body is making a decision, it does not have to give reasons for that decision, uh, unless fairness requires that reasons be given. And he referred expressly to the duty case that I mentioned, and he referred expressly to the dental surgery Really. But then he said, um, he went on, he said, um, fairness is not necessarily the only value that underlies the common law. So when the court stepped forward and said, actually, in this context, that decision maker should have given reasons for uh, the decision, it's not just fairness. He also referred to the dictates of good administration. He was quoting from another judgment. The dictates of good administration and the need for transparency. And transparency, look, anybody who's familiar with the global administrative law debates, and the MIU uh, work then, the ears prick up this mention of transparency as a value that is infusing and driving a duty to give reasons um, in the common law. He also said, um, he talked about fairness, he said duty concerned fairness as between the state and an individual citizen, so in terms of the, 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 the tension between or balancing the interests of, of the public administration and decision making and individuals, fairness is there. But he also said a further common law principle is in play, um, can be in play, excuse me, can be in play, which is the principle of open justice or transparency. Uh, he said that extends as much to statutory inquiries and procedures as it does to courts. That's an interesting point because if the duty to give reasons, I don't think Kent and Dover is meant to be constrained narrowly on its facts. So if the duty to give reasons it fastens upon, well, if it's fairness, okay, fairness comes in as a residual requirement and says, uh, it would be fair in these circumstances to give reasons. But surely if, if uh, open justice or transparency is a value that infuses it, surely then that becomes a different starting point. Because we assume then on that basis that reasons should always be given unless there would be some uh, explanation as to why they shouldn't be given. I, I, I think that point can be made. Um, and this is the interesting bit uh, about uh, theme five. Towards the end he said, uh, he refers to the Art House Convention. Lord Cornwall is very keen on the Art House Convention. He refers to it uh, lots. He referred to it in, um, in the Walton case as well. And he said when we talk about reasons and the duty to give reasons, there are duties in European law. Uh, there would be a duty to give reasons under the Art House Convention. Uh, and that's a point of intersection with EU law. And he said, and he uses these words, he says, in this respect, the common law and European law and practice march together. So he's essentially saying the common law and the European approach to duty of good reasons is, is a, well, it can't really be distinguished. Now, I'd be interested to see, leaving it aside the earlier uh, frivolity about Brexit, it will be interesting to see how far the common law and European law continues to march together after Brexit, depending on what happens. Of course, the Aarhus Convention will still apply uh, and query the debates about well, how far should the courts look at the Court of Justice rulings on, on the relevant directives even after uh, departure with it, let's see. Uh, and his final point that he, he made goes back to the, the tension between the interests of administrative efficiency, requiring administrative decision makers to do too much uh, and causing difficulties uh, with, within the administration as against individual interests. In paragraph 56, he basically said, well, in this sort of a case, decision makers can just get on with it, they have to give reasons. So. Three questions that come back to the uh, questionnaire. 
I want to be very interested to know how other systems approach the tension between efficiency and individual interests. Um, the common law starting point, reasons don't have to be given unless fairness requires them, it, it can now be doubted, I think, in the, in the light of Kent and Dover, that arguably, well, if, if one takes the, the, the open justice to transparency point, uh, that um, the balance seems to be very much towards individual or other interests. What remedies are given for breaches of a duty to give reasons in other systems? This is a point that's discussed in the Kent and Dover case as well, it's, it popped up. Whether or not, if there's a breach of a duty to give reasons, does that automatically mean that the decision should be quashed? Uh, or can reasons be given, could a court order that reasons be given after? Because that goes towards what we would, I suppose, call ex post facto rationalisation, which uh, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering is completely inconsistent with the duty to give reasons because the reasons are meant to be fashioned around a participative process. So uh, what, what remedies are given in other systems? Is this even a, an issue? Um, and this, the idea of transparency is an enforceable legal value or principle. I'd be interested to hear what other systems do in terms of uh, transparency, which is um, referred to very clearly in the, in the Kent and Dover case, uh, how far is transparency uh, something with which other systems engage. Okay, so thank you. I, I would like to, to, to ask a question to Marie Gauthier, because uh, uh, you have emphasized that a uh, one important difference between the, uh, the judicial courts and the administrative courts, or basically the Conseil d'État and the, the, the judicial judge in, uh, in France, is that uh, uh, ordinary judges uh, uh, have an individual conception of, uh, of independence, whereas a, um, the Conseil d'État and administrative judges at large have what you call a collective conception of independence. A, I understand what you mean, I, I understood your words, I think, that uh, the, the collective, uh, that, coll that collective conception of independence means uh, basically that the important thing is not to have the executive or the, uh, the other authorities of, of the state uh, putting their, uh, their hands into, the, into judicial business back. My question is, in practical terms, in the uh, daily uh, working of, uh, you can say, the TA or of the uh, administ administrative courts uh, as a whole, how does that work? Does that mean uh, for instance, that uh, the president of a section may give some sort of indications to the members of the section, but, uh, just to, 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 to put an example. So, so uh, in, uh, in practically internal terms, how does that collective conception of independence work? <coughs> I have another question for Gordon. Oh, <laughs> Gordon, you said you said it, it came to me because it's a, it's a field that has a long time uh, 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 occupied my my reflections. You said that a. The DPP, the Director of Public Prosecutions, in principle, has no duty to give, to give reasons when he or she decides whether to prosecute or not. My question is, in, uh, in uh, British or English, English law, is there uh, uh, the, the DPP and at large the prosecutors are uh, characterized as part of administration for the, for the purposes of judicial review of administrative action. In other words, public officials in charge of uh, conducting the, the criminal process are administrative? Is that part of administrative law? Okay, thank you. That's a really difficult question. You can 
<laughs> well, this is a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I would just like to take an approach from a, a Portuguese point of view because we have a dual jurisdiction in Portugal since uh, 19, uh, 1986, but actually there is nowadays a major trend about the merger of the two jurisdictions. There is a proposal of a pact of justice that was endorsed by the Portuguese Bar Association and by the judges of the courts also uh, and also by the public attorneys and they are proposing to the government and to the legislative the adoption of a single jurisdiction going against this idea of a French, uh, of a French separation of jurisdictions. Um, Actually, the Portuguese constitution says that it should, it should have, it should be an administrative jurisdiction to judge administrative relations. But the jurisprudence of the Portuguese constitutional courts also accepts that judicial courts may uh, make a judicial review of some actions of the public administration. For instance, the application of administrative uh, sanctions. Uh, in Portugal, we have a similar, um, we have a system of administrative sanctions much more similar to Germany than to Spain, because in Spain you do apply administrative decisions in order to sanction uh, the breach of law, but we apply a system much more like the criminal system in Portugal actually in order to endorse those sanctions. So I would like also to know uh, what should be the jurisdiction that would apply these administrative sanctions, the administrative one or the judicial criminal one. Uh, another note that I would like to leave and it was a point for discussion is how do we control, how do you review uh, in administrative courts the use of discretionary powers? Because nowadays there is, um, well, there is a, a major predominance of technocracy. Uh, the parliaments do not have the guts to adopt laws that are precise that can be known by citizens. It is difficult for parties to join together and to have clear decisions. So they adopt generic laws. And then it is public administration who has the task to, uh, well, to define how to apply those general laws. And so it is also, nowadays we have this huge amount of discretionary powers by public administration and sometimes the technocrats they told uh, they, they tell us i am the specialist you have not the power to review my action because i am the engineer i am the physician i am the architect so please stay out of my decision and then for courts and for courts of poor countries like, my, like mine, it's difficult because judges do not have the experts to help them in order to scrutinize that exercise of discretionary and technical powers. And actually, Gordon was talking about global law. Nowadays, we also have global technical standards and it is difficult for a national court to review it and to control those kind of technical standards so i would like to hear you all of you about that dif difficulty of reviewing those discretionary powers uh, another question that it and i i promise that that for this time it is my last approach um, we were also talking about uh, judicial independence. Actually, 
in my past, I have been member of the Portuguese National Committee for Elections, that it is an independent body of the Portuguese public administration. And I was also advisor at the Portuguese Constitutional Court. And so I had this experience of dealing with judges that also assume offices in administrative bodies. In Portugal, it's very common to nominate a judge, an ancient judge, a jubilee judge, to lead, to preside a regulatory or an independent body. In the Constitutional Court, our Portuguese Constitution assumes that at least six of the 13 judges must be also judges. And so the National Parliament is bound to designate at least six judges. Actually, my, ex my personal experience, maybe it is a wrong one, tells me that judges that are nominated as excellent uh, jurists and not they are not ju judges of career. How do I say that? Career judges is that? Okay, I can say that. I, I think that <coughs> career judges are less independent actually than the ones that are politically nominated. For instance, in Portugal, it is very criticized that the national parliament designates the members of the Portuguese Constitutional Court. But if we compare the decisions taken by each judge, ju career judges are much more predictable than the judges that are not career judges. Academics, uh, lawyers, independent judges, because they are much more independent, much more autonomous. There is another problem that is making me a little bit worried nowadays that is it is judicial populism nowadays any any woman any man can express himself in the social networks in the web in the net and so that is promoting in the media uh, a great pressure over the judges Nowadays, it's very easy for a judge to be pressured to grant an interim measure in order to suspend an administrative decision. In criminal, in criminal procedure, it's very often, um, it's very usual to see judges granting arrest, uh, detentive measures and preventive arrests just because the newspapers say that this guy is guilty and in administrative law we are also facing that kind of problem. So I would also like to know how can we combine and make and to take some equilibrium between the fight against corruption, the fight against money laundering of course, administrative law, it's also a strategic measure in order to do that, in order to find that, uh, that bridge, that violation of public interest. But I believe that nowadays, administrative judges are also under pressure, under the pressure of public opinion. And it's difficult for us as scientists, as women and men of law, of study, of science, to, to be at the same place as common citizens that are conducted by their, their emotions and not by their rationality. But I believe that the independence of the judiciary, <coughs> it's also a guarantee of civil liberties, but I, I have some doubts if nowadays some courts do not decide under the pressure of public opinion and not according to law science. Okay, so it's just for now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy question. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Just um, two sets of uh, comments concerning um, 
what Marie and Gordon have um, said. The first set is um, about the general concept of, of, of how the um, Anglo-Saxon vis-a-vis the continental European systems operate in the field of uh, judicial review of administrative action. I think basically there are four distinctive um, criteria. The first is um, the how we perceive judges. And Marie um, mentioned that um, the judges of the Conseil d'État spend a significant part of their career life with the administration, and they do have an education from the administration, and they keep on interacting with the administration. And this is due to the historical background of the body, which was originally conceived as the counselor to the uh, state. Um, in the eyes of um, the jurists from other legal systems, um, this sort of interaction could clearly jeopardize the impartiality of the judge. So um, our perception, and this is a difference, uh, this is an idiosyncratic, I think, characteristic of, of the French administrative um, system, um, we want our judges to be rather isolated from the administration in order to secure this kind of artificial um, impartiality. The second um, comment is about the judge again. Um, the, I think that the Anglo-Saxon tradition is about the, the strengthening of the concept of the individuality of the judge. The judge, as a person, um, does have a very distinct legal personality. Um, and this is why the decisions ought to emphasize upon the personal view of each judge. And eventually, the legitimacy of the decision is, I think, in the Anglo-Saxon tradition, the uh, accumulation of the individual opinions of each judge, as opposed to our tradition in uh, continental Europe, where we do insist upon the esprit de corps, which is the foundation of what we think is the important action of this sort of collective legitimacy of the court. The third issue is about how judges decide, and I think the major distinction here is about between principles, this is the basic idea of uh, a continental administrative uh, judge, as opposed to pragmatism, which is the idea of an Anglo-Saxon uh, judge. If you see the, the, judi the judicial vehicles of the judges in their respective legal systems, you can easily see that uh, for the eyes of um, a continental lawyer, the unreasonableness test of the Anglo-Saxon tradition could not stand, in fact, because it's not legal enough, it's not technical enough. Um, as opposed to principles which are more uh, technically oriented, such as proportionality or legitimate expectations or uh, whatever. And the, and the fourth point is about the public interest. Very correctly, you um, set for the idea of this sort of idea of, of public interest, and this is quite akin, I think, in uh, Europe. We considered that there is something which is over and above the uh, articulation and accumulation of, of, of private interests, and the judge ought to actually serve these uh, public interests, as opposed to the idea, to a different idea of pluralism, um, which is mainly in the United States, about what a public interest stands. And this is a free enterprise, a free competition of, of competing private interests. We do not serve this in Europe. We want public interest to prevail. Just to mention on this point that this could also be a danger for the judiciary. The president of the Greek uh, Council of State, Conseil d'État, uh, resigned last week, be claiming that he could not put up with the idea that he cannot impose his view of public interest concerning the pension cuts 
based on the um, memoranda with the institutions and because he was a minority in his own court. So public interest justified, in a sense, the idea that judges could just get off the burden of affiliation to the court. Um, now going to Gordon, I'm very happy that Gordon um, set out the issue of the duty to give reasons because this is the key issue, I think, which makes distinctive its uh, legal system. And this is a to totally different approach in uh, the UK legal system as opposed to the uh, continental system because in principle in the continent there is a duty to give reason. This duty is either statutory or it is imposed by the nature of the impugned act, which means that if there is an, an administrative act which produces adverse effects to individuals, then by nature this act ought to be justified by the administrative authority issuing the act. So either by statute or by the nature, there is in principle, in principle a duty to give reasons. Of course, there is a variation as to the threshold and the criteria for the completeness of the duty to give reasons, but there is a presumption of a duty to give reasons in our legal systems. Now, the crucial issue is what are the effects of the potential annulment on the ground of lack of duty to give reasons. And here, there are three options. Option A, which is the strict option, is that the decision is quashed and the administration cannot bring back the same uh, decision, um, even with different reasoning. So eventually, the result is that the decision is altogether not. The second option is that um, the impugned act goes back to the administration and the administration can come back again with the same outcome, so with the same option, but with different reasoning. So a sort of accomplishment <coughs> of the duty to give reason and um, following the um, rationale of the court. And the third option, which is something that in the last 10 or 15 years seems to prevail, I think, in European courts, is that, well, if there is a, a, a fail on the part of the administrative agency to respect the duty to give reasons, then the decision is not quashed unless it can be proven that the administrative agency would have reached a different decision in substance. In order to preserve administrative efficiency and uh, prevent a um, great number of annulments on that ground, what happens is that we give a second chance to the administration before the court to defend the actual administrative outcome. It happens in France also, and in Greece, and in other continental European systems. In order for the administration to come over and fulfill the criteria of um, the intelligible um, reasoning, and then if the administration, which has the burden of proof then, to show that the decision is rational in substance, if the administration before the court convinced the judges that this is the right course of option, then irrespective of the uh, flaw on the part of the duty, then the decision is not caused. So essentially, in that case, the judge becomes the administrator. Or she administrator. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Thank you, David. Uh, I um, I'm truly grateful to uh, both uh, general reporters for uh, uh, the excellent reports uh, which they produced to us and uh, which uh, uh, introduced to our discussion. I would like uh, uh, only to, um, uh, to, to, to bring into the discussion at this stage an, uh, a, a number of uh, historical elements which uh, uh, give some explanations uh, to the similarities or the differences of uh, the systems. And there are similarities in areas which no one easily suspects that the, the systems are similar. 
Uh, we, uh, uh, Marie started uh, her uh, um, introduction by a phrase of uh, Rivero, Jean Rivero, uh, saying, actually he was uh, a founding member of uh, our group, uh, who uh, said that uh, the droit administratif, uh, uh, the, fr the French administrative law, uh, uh, is in fact a French product, more or less. Uh, and this is true, because in Ara as from 1200, uh, the uh, French, uh, what is today French state, uh, started developing and maturing uh, through the ages. But uh, from the beginning up to today, it has some things which have been proved unchangeable. Number one, that uh, this state was uh, created around the development of a public administration. There was the king, the nation was uh, represented, was uh, incarnated uh, by the king, and the king had uh, developed gradually over the centuries a public administration, uh, and the public administration was uh, expressing the public interest because it was the reflection of the king, the king being the sacrosanct person of, uh, in the middle of the system. Now, you see since 1200 onwards that uh, this king creates a Conseil du Roi and a Cour de Compte. The, uh, 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 the competencies uh, vary through the age, uh, the, the centuries, but they uh, vary, but the institutions remain the same. There is always a Conseil d'État, there is always a Cour de Compte. When we have big battles like the French uh, Revolution, those institutions uh, are in danger, public administration, Conseil d'État, Cour de Compte, but at the end they make it, they survive. Why they survive? Because they readapt to the new situation. And they are useful. The, it is very, very important to, to remember that the French Revolution found a powerful public administration, which was given to them by the absolute state, and the revolution decided not to change it, not even to democratize it, because they had the need to impose their will to the provinces and the revolution to the provinces, and they needed the public administration powerful, the same way the king before wanted this public administration powerful. And the system starts being democratized with uh, uh, the uh, Third Republic, na uh, 1872, it's uh, after the Prussian, French Prussian War, and the uh, Commune de Paris, uh, that uh, they introduced the Tribunal de Conflit, they introduced the idea that the Conseil d'État judges in its own name and not as a councillor to the head of state, and uh, they, instead of uh, punishing the Conseil d'État for having collaborated with uh, the third, uh, uh, with Napoleon III, uh, they reshaped it into a democratic institution, and we see how it evolves. We have later, in the, the 80s, big changes in France, in the French administration, <coughs> because we had a political change which was waited for for about 30 years. And these changes brought a new concept into the Conseil d'État, which we see in the 90s uh, uh, and later. <coughs> The system has the power to be uh, re-elaborated from internally, and they do it. But at the end, it remains the same. It's like uh, you know, they had uh, their system. They had uh, in the, the universities. They had two years plus two years that makes the uh, maîtrise. And then uh, one year um, uh, masters, three years PhD. They had to adapt to 
the Bologna process. So they did three years, master's one, master's two, <laughs> which means three years plus one, l'ancienne la, la, uh, maîtrise, master's two, l'ancienne de A, three years uh, PhD. That's the French way. And they did it miraculously. <laughs> and uh, so uh, let us go to England. Uh, in England, we had a difference. The difference was, first of all, that uh, the size of the kingdom was very small. It, uh, it's uh, one-tenth uh, of uh, the size of, uh, of France. Uh, so everything was easier to, uh, 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 to work with, and uh, uh, the British crown did not develop a public administration. I mean, strangely enough, and I believe the idea came to me today, to be honest. They have uh, 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 followed the same system with the classic Romans, the system of uh, uh, the uh, office organ. The sheriff was an office and an organ. The, uh, the justice of peace was an office and an organ. The same system uh, with the classic uh, uh, Rome. And uh, of course they had the, uh, the local uh, uh, authorities, which again is the same system like the classic Rome. Athens continued existing after the, the, the conquest, and they were producing the laws of, uh, of Athens. Uh, nobody bothered, bothered them to do that. But uh, you see, now in this system in England, the king created a court which was his, Henry II, I think. He stepped down from the court, he put professionals in the court, and he sent the court around England to remind everyone that law and justice was his. Now, in this system, they developed, and you know better the history than me, they developed little by little the possibility also to question the administrative acts. The same way as in France, because in France, when they were developing this uh, uh, Conseil d'État administrative litigation, it was in the, uh, uh, in the name of the public interest. This was done because the king said, how is it possible that anyone challenges my decisions? I am the sovereign. I will allow everyone to uh, to challenge my decisions if I judge, uh, I am the, the, the judge of the decisions. Of course, I will not do it by myself because, myself because I have other things to do. It will be done through the Conseil d'État. It comes from 1200, the idea. But at the same period of time, you start in this country, the expat system. It's the same thing. Can you go to today to the court to challenge an administrative decision? By yourselves, no. You have to go ex parte. I mean, the king, the queen goes against herself, ex parte. Eh? It's the same. This. So it's the same system. Now, in this history, you remember that you had the Stuarts. The Stuarts, Stuarts tried to bring the French system. And it became a blasphemy even to remember the Star Chamber. You remember. Uh, 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 the, um, the great constitutionalist who looks like uh, Paul Craig. Uh, <laughs> Dicey. Dicey, Dicey. Dicey says. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Ta time and again. <laughs> Thank God we did not uh, have, a, uh, uh, we did not develop the Star Chamber system. The Star Chamber system was the Conseil d'Etat. But you got rid of them and you got rid of all of the system because it was not you. You had your own system. Thank you very much at the moment. Thank you. <coughs> um, so, as they say in the best political circles, I am at a disadvantage not having heard the presentations earlier. Um, and therefore, there's a slight logical difficulty in commenting on presentations that I haven't heard, but it's never stopped me before. <laughs> so I don't see why I should start worrying about it now. Um, uh, but nonetheless, I mean, having just got an idea of what was spoken about, or the general themes, just I think for the purposes of the 
present, just two comments, one about legal reasoning and one about the relationship between courts and administration, both of which have been talked about in the discussion thus far. Um, and I agree with a great deal of what's been said already, but just about legal reasoning, common law versus um, civil law. So I, I think I'd just make kind of two points in that regard. The first is that, um, and I don't really need to make this given that we have so many excellent civil lawyers in the room, but one should of course be wary of assuming that there's one model of legal reasoning or judicial reasoning which applies to all civil law regimes. If you look at the reasoning of the Bundesverfassungsgericht, it's actually very different indeed from the reasoning of the Conseil d'État. Um, now, certainly, if you compare the Conseil d'État in France to the uh, classic reasoning of a superior court in the UK, I think they are markedly different. I mean, the French model is very much a sort of Cartesian idea of whereas, 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 <laughs> conclusion. Um, well, it's over. Uh, <laughs> we abandoned the whereas. <laughs> oh, well, okay. So that's, that's traditionally what it's been. Um, it's traditionally been in that way. And, but that seems to me, forget the form, the form of uh, particular use of words, that seems to me that mode of reasoning with very short judgments, very short opinions, um, uh, was designed in many ways to hide the ball. Well, whether it was designed to hide the ball or whether it certainly had the effect of hiding the ball. In other words, you do not see uh, classic conseil d'etat rulings wearing their normative or policy uh, concerns on the face of the judgment. That's not what it's about. What it's about is giving people the appearance that this is an inexorable conclusion which follows from certain premises and the idea that, well, we could go this way in normative terms, we could go that way, we might do this if we weigh the factors <coughs> this way. You don't see that in, uh, in, in superior court judgments of the Conseil d'État. You see that all the time in UK judge, judgments both of the Court of Appeal and, the, and of the House of Lords or Supreme Court. And that's partly for what George said, that we don't have the same collective. It's not just that we have individual judgments and not a single judgment, but we also have judges who actually think, this is my take on the problem, and I'm going to tell you about my take on the problem, uh, whatever the problem is. And they'll say that they'll do that even if they concur with the result of somebody else, but they'll just say that I want to put my spin on the reasoning um, uh, because I've got my own spin that I want to put on the reasoning. And if you want to look at a marvelous recent <coughs> example of this big house of laws decision about uh, negligence liability against public bodies, Reed giving the majority judgment, Mance coming in with a concurring judgment, reaching the same conclusion, but very much wanting to say, yeah, I buy into the result, but really I've got something to say about the way we get there and how we're doing this. So I do think that certainly if you're comparing the, the, the Conseil d'État and, and uh, classic common law courts, I think there are um, significant differences and much greater willingness in um, and I'm not making any judgment about whether this is right or wrong, I'm just saying as a matter of fact, you'll see policy arguments, normative arguments, etc., on the face of the judgments in the way that you won't so much in the Conseil d'État. On the other hand, in the Bundeswehrfassungsgericht, in big cases, you see it all the time. I mean, you read any of the big, uh, the ones I'm most familiar with tend to be the ones which involve EU law as well. But if you're reading Galweiler in the Bundeswehrfassungsgericht, or if you're reading the Lisbon judgment or the Maastricht judgment, I mean, these are long judgments of the Bundeswehrfassungsgericht where there's complex reasoning with complex normative argumentation on the face of the judgment. So anyway, that's the first thing about legal reasoning. The second thing 
Um, I think that it is, or at least it would be interesting to discuss whether other people agree with this or not. I think there is a slightly, I think there is an interesting difference. Again, I'm not saying the difference plays out in the same way across all civil law systems. I think there is a difference, at least in part, about the relationship between court and administration. And it plays out in various ways. Um, just to put one example down now, because I don't want to eat up too much time before lunch, um, uh, and we can perhaps go back to it this afternoon, but for example, uh, a common law judge might well say something along the following lines. There might, a common law judge might well say, there's an issue of law here, it is definitely analytically in analytical terms, so definitely in analytical terms, it is an issue of law, but I'm going to show some respect to the primary decision maker, the administration, and I think they've got some expertise, not only about fact finding, but about legal determinations, and I'm going to give some latitude to the administration in the way in which they give the answer to that legal question, whatever the legal question is, meaning the term employee, etc. Now that's particularly a, um, uh, a, 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 an express mode of reasoning in the States, in Canada, but also uh, to some extent in, uh, in, it, it's coming in, in the UK, at least in part. Now one can question about whether they ought to do it more, don't do it enough, all of that, but they do it. What I'm saying is that certainly when I talk to civil lawyers in France, the idea that you would proceed in a mode of reasoning which said this is a question of law, forget I know about tied in discretionary powers, but leaving that aside for the moment, because I've always found that really weird anyway, <laughs> I can come back to that. Um, uh, um, we can come back to that after lunch and have a good fight about that one. But I mean, okay. um, but, but, um, but the idea that a French judge would say it's an issue of law, but they're better at it than we are, and that therefore we're going to give them some considerable leeway, doesn't strike me as the kind of reasoning which your average member of the Conseil d'État is going to sign up to very easily. At least the ones I've spoken to, and when I've spoken to, to, um, to French lawyers. Now, I get, I mean, again, I know that in German law there are indefinite legal concepts and you have a bit of this in German law, but actually that's nowhere close to what happens in America or Canada. <coughs> so anyway, enough. Thank you. Um, just a few words. When we started today, I was under the impression that we were about to hear a presentation of uh, the two sides, the two legal traditions, the two families. And having participated in the past in such debates, I thought that what I was going to hear would be uh, a kind of, uh, you know, a dogma presentation, <laughs> which can expand to specific uh, areas. <coughs> um, I was not disappointed because it was not so. What I saw was an interaction and an interrelation of uh, the two sides, the two traditions, which uh, brought in mind that uh, living in an era of globalization, we live uh, different phenomena in justice. One of them is the, the need to communicate our idea ideas to the outside, to other families of, uh, of law, and to receive from them uh, specific elements. Um, so regarding this, the basic distinction between common law and continental law, there are specific international courts like the European Court of Human Rights, for example, the European Court of Justice that we said before, that uh, they have surpassed, overpassed this specific line that, you know, draws the distinction between continental law and uh, uh, common law. Does this mean that we have a, an underlying legal culture in the two areas that is starting to mix, to create a hybrid? Do we have a hy hybridization of justice, a new era of justice? I think this would be an interesting uh, question to, to discuss. I, I raised the issue. And uh, what about uh, justice politics, justice economics? Uh, living in the era of globalization, we have new, uh, new, uh, new uh, subjects to discuss. For example, what would be the reaction of, uh, of a continental judge? And uh, what would be the reaction of a common law judge in the case that we have uh, 
uh, the possibility of selling and buying human organs. In the States, this is an issue. Um, the, the continental law judge would uh, search for, for a rule. The legislator would have to uh, create the initial regulation and then the administration to impose the specific procedure and then the administrative judge would have to decide on this. In, on the other hand, the, the common law judge would look for precedence, the specific case. And what would happen if we go back to a situation where both things do not exist? Something like uh, the, the veil of ignorance of rose, who said that in a situation of equality with no bias, we have to decide on the initial pr principle. So what, what would be the, the leading theory of justice in such a situation? And how would this be uh, estimated in the uh, a situation where interaction and interrelation is a work in progress, like today, not only in Europe, but worldwide? The second thing, um, I wouldn't think differently because I, I am a continental judge. Je disais toujours, je disais de l'administration, c'est toujours uh, administré, c'est ça. I wouldn't think of it differently. Although sometimes, um, for the from the outside, if we look at this procedure, um, individuals in a democratic society believe that judging an administrative decision is, uh, in a way, trying to change the will of the administration towards a more a different um, um, approach. This is not the case. For the continental judge, at least, uh, it is not the, say, the case for sure. Let me close my intervention with uh, one specific uh, issue. There is also another thing going on today, at least in Europe. Uh, we heard before about the Cour de Compte. The courts of audit are not quite the same within the globe, nor within Europe. In some cases, they are courts with C capital. In other cases, they are um, auditing institutions. And there is a middle situation as well. And there are some forms of uh, judicial intervention. For example, in Greece, there is the idea of uh, auditing, uh, I'll use the, uh, the words of the Constitution, auditing contracts of high economic value, which is more than one million. Um, and there the judge is very close to the administrative role. How would we react in such a situation? What would be the, the common law approach? What would be the, the continental law approach? I think it would be interesting. Thank you. Yeah, uh, well, let me share you something about the uh, experience in the Netherlands and why uh, judicial review is really the main topic of debate, uh, I think, the last three years. And I think there are uh, three factors for that. Uh, one is in the theory, uh, one is in uh, judicial review, is a reaction in, uh, on the way the legislature and the administration uh, act. So if you see uh, changes in the political landscape, you see probably changes in judicial review. Uh, and we have earthquakes, and I'm not really aware if this was European news, but in the northern part of uh, Netherlands, a lot of gas is uh, extracted and uh, it runs into uh, 10 billion of euros a year. So there are huge financial incentives for the state uh, for gas extraction, uh, but we also have main problems in the northern part of the Netherlands with a lot of earthquakes and uh, houses uh, collapsing. Uh, people really turned their back to government, uh, didn't want to vote anymore, and uh, uh, the Socialist Party lost all their support in the northern part of the Netherlands. So these are factors that really pressured the Dutch system uh, and to question why um, the judicial review um, should be intensified. And I think a special element to the debate is that the Dutch uh, legal system is quite special and maybe it's a bit in between a continental and common law system um, because uh, we don't have a constitutional court. Uh, in our constitution it is forbidden to review the con uh, constitutionality of our statutes. Um, and we don't have any appeal procedure against rules and regulation. And that makes our judge a bit handicapped. He can only review individual acts, our administrative law judge. And this is really the biggest discussion within the Netherlands, uh, because we have a lot of power with the legislator, we have a lot of power within the administration, and we have some power <laughs> within the judiciary. And now we see in that if we look 
uh, especially to the US debate, thinking about the administrat administrative state, how can we counterbalance it? We look at the European Union and we see the way uh, regulations are reviewed and we see professionality te tests, we see a necessity test, and that really challenges our legal system. So um, it's very clear that there is a duty to give reasons if it comes to individual acts, but it's not clear at all that there's a duty to give reasons for general acts. Actually, we only have an arbitrariness and capricious test, and we wonder, should we reform our system and look to the way the European Union does it, and can a judge uh, say a rule is uh, illegal because it violates uh, uh, legal principles? And that's a main point uh, of discussion. And just to add one element uh, to your questions, uh, is it allowed for the administration to give reasons afterwards if the, if the decision is found to be illegal or during the procedures? Well, we do it a lot because we are so focused on the individual acts, our whole system is focused on individual dispute settlement. So the administration always gets the possibility to give the reasons uh, for the decision taken, and the success rate of appeals really dropped because now we give them uh, the possibility within the procedure and we only force a decision if it influenced the material outcome. And I think the success rate uh, dropped under the 5 or 10 percent, so it's really, really low. And that's also a big factor of criticisms uh, from lawyers. They say it's, it's almost impossible to fight government effectively if the possibilities to give uh, reasons are so broad. Thank you. Thank you. I will also focus on the question of the self-understanding of administrative judges in Germany. Until uh, the 1930s, we had a very fragmented system of administrative ju justice. And then, under the uh, fundamental law, uh, the decision was taken to establish an independent branch of administrative justice in, in the judiciary in, in Germany, with the same constitutional status as the ordinary and the other uh, courts and the other branches of, of the judiciary. And the purpose of the administrative uh, justice is to defend individual rights. It is necessary for the um, success of a, of a, a case in, in an administrative course, not only that the administrative decision is illegal, but also that it violates uh, individual rights. So one should think that the administrative courts in Germany are <coughs> defendant of individual rights and the public administration has little to little success. But, but if we look at the success rates uh, in the average of, of German administrative courts, it's also 10% over the years. And um, the, the, the main reason, I think, is that administrative judges bear in mind always the public interest. Mm -hmm. uh, and they often choose uh, an interpretation of the legal basis of the cases which favors the public interest. There has been one interesting exception, and that brings me to the question uh, uh, of the problem to give reasons. In 1960, a new statute on planning law was introduced on the national level, and it introduced a duty to give reasons to, for city councils when they adopt development plans, and, and they couldn't make it. Uh, therefore, a very high success rate was uh, when landowners attack development plans. Uh, over the 60s, uh, I think the success rate was, I think, 50%. And then the legislator intervened and said, oh, this is not what we meant. We have to reduce the success rate because this is, uh, uh, this is um, against administrative efficiency and they introduced a long list of errors which are not relevant for the outcome of, uh, of the uh, case and a list of errors which can be corrected afterwards. So the court decisions now are normally, they list the number of errors in the, in the procedure, in the reasoning, in, in the balancing of the interests, and they, then they come to the conclusion, but they are irrelevant because the result in the plan would be, have been the same. Mm. Um, I could mention other principles, and the interesting thing is that there is one area of administrative law which has not been given 
to the administrative courts, but to the ordinary courts. This is uh, compensation for expropriation yeah. and and tort law. State, uh, how do you say, uh, torts yeah. committed by, by public authorities. Mm -hmm. These two areas are given to the civil courts. And one of the reasons for this is that civil courts are more um, likely uh, to give um, uh, the right to the citizen. So administrative courts are under the suspicion that they would be too reluctant to give compensation or uh, comp uh, uh, to, uh, um, how to say, for, for torts, um, damages, damages uh, in, 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 in these cases. Um, so this is an um, uh, interesting perspective on how, how German administrative law is conceived by, by, by politicians, because they, they took the decisions. Hey, may I just, before we, uh, we go, we have the same rule in Greece about that uh, it's the civil law court which decides uh, for expropriation. How, what is the cost of the expropriation? It's written in the Constitution. And I believe you have the word FET. Yes, we used to have it. But <laughs> uh, you don't have one fed anymore? Well, we, we have it uh, now, but it is uh, only for a specific uh, uh, issue when, uh, when you have no more property for the, the private person. So it's no very useful anymore. Dear President, they have uh, fish and chips today on the condition that we go uh, urgently. Otherwise, <laughs> Well, thank you all. There's lots of lots to talk about now. <laughs> well, the first, the, the, the first thing to do, I think, uh, is to come back to Maria and um, Gordon uh, to pick up the points which were or some of the points were raised in the round of topic before lunch. And, uh, and then after that, we'll see where it goes. But I, I think we should try to focus on each of the five areas of, of questioning uh, uh, as, uh, as I said before. So, uh, to okay, ladies first ladies again. First again. <laughs> okay, uh, so we will start in the same uh, uh, order uh, as the question was uh, asking and uh, trying to start with the first one about uh, how we uh, is it working in uh, our daily work uh, to organize this uh, discipline within the administrative jurisdiction? Uh, it was I think, uh, the, the, the question. Um, well, that, that's a, a, a tough one. Um, I will, well, I think basically the most important thing is the education and the culture and the fact that we just respect the decision of <laughs> Given before, uh, especially uh, in the Tribunal Administrative and Administrative Court of Appeal, uh, they just follow the case law of the Conseil d'État because, well, this is the way they were taught to do so. Uh, there is no instruction, it's just the way they are done. But we have also um, a few mechanisms uh, to uh, uh, assure that. Uh, one of the mechanisms is that um, for new questions, uh, you don't have to wait uh, the Conseil d'État uh, to uh, give a ruling on it. Um, Tribunal Administrative and Administrative Court of Appeal uh, can uh, ask directly uh, the Conseil d'État a question. Uh, it, it's a kind of a preliminary ruling, but within the administrative jurisdiction. And this is uh, very uh, useful <laughs> to uh, skip all the, uh, uh, all the road uh, to the Conseil d'État and have immediately a, 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 a case law on, on new questions. And uh, within the Conseil d'État, uh, there is no uh, instruction uh, given by President. I think there are uh, too many ways uh, to uh, describe all of them, but uh, I will just say two things. First, first of all, um, there is no individual decision in the Conseil, Conseil d'État. Uh, this is uh, uh, al always, always uh, collegiality decisions. So uh, the way of uh, having uh, uh, discipline is that we are all together, at least uh, nine judges for uh, almost every uh, case. 
to, to decide. And there is a special institution inside the Conseil d'État named the Troika, uh, which is uh, <laughs> uh, which is um, composed uh, of uh, four people. It is the president of the section du contentieux and the three uh, uh, deputy uh, of the president of the section du contentieux, of the section du contentieux, and uh, all of them are uh, um, are they are watching at every 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 decision given by the Conseil d'État. There is not any a single decision that is not going in front of one of those four people. And they meet every week uh, on a, a Tuesday afternoon and discuss about all the cases. And they check that there is no uh, way that we have uh, different answers to the same questions in every week. So I think this is probably uh, <coughs> the way we have uh, discipline in, in, inside the Conseil d'État. Um, to move to the second uh, uh, topics, uh, use of discretionary power. Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, well, the, the Conseil d'État uh, wrote the law basically uh, because every project uh, is going in front of uh, the adversary uh, part of the Conseil d'État. Separation of powers in its best. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, <coughs> probably when the law is uh, um, quite general and not uh, treating a very specific problem, uh, the judge part of the Conseil d'État uh, has no uh, problem to complete it uh, with the case law. So we, we, we deal it uh, with the writing more precisely uh, in, in the case law that we have in the law. And, and, um, so it, it's not a, a, a question. What, what the problem is, I think, it was, was uh, what you were talking about at the end of uh, uh, your speech, uh, the problem of very technical question, because even if the members of the Conseil d'État are, of course, uh, brilliant and uh, omnipotent and so on, um, there are some fields, uh, technical fields, in where we are not very specialists. And that's, uh, that's a new question, I think, for us. We solve it with what we are calling enquête à la barre. Uh, it means that we are doing some uh, uh, public hearings uh, with all the parties, and we are asking them precise questions on technical aspects. Uh, and uh, we also uh, now uh, using a lot of experts on field that we are not very good in. Um, I, I'm working in a, in a chamber where we deal with uh, all the, um, let's say, uh, internet uh, questions. And uh, we, uh, we have uh, probably 10 uh, Google uh, case on the table for now. And uh, we are doing a lot of that on uh, and uh, asking experts to, well, Enlighten us about precise uh, <coughs> questions. Are the experts um, chosen by the court yeah. or uh, designated no. by the parties? No, we, we are to choose the expert. <coughs> well, sometimes we ask the parties directly some so questions, but uh, we, we choose it. Um, and um, uh, about the question of uh, independence and uh, the process of nomination, we were talking about it uh, uh, this morning. Um, the French Supreme Court, uh, we, we have uh, three Supreme Courts. The Conseil Constitutionnel is really something special for us. Uh, it's a very political body, uh, and, and the nomination in it are very political, so it's quite different. But for the Conseil d'État, uh, except for the vice president, uh, who uh, is uh, chosen directly uh, by the uh, president, I mean the president of the republic, um, the nomination uh, in all important positions within the Conseil d'État are decided by the Conseil d'État itself. 
so it's a kind of guarantee of our independence. Uh, and for entering in the Conseil d'État, you have the you have uh, most of the people are coming from uh, Ena, so they are basically uh, the best of their school. So there is no uh, choosing in, in that uh, way of entering the Conseil d'État. And for what we call the uh, Tour Extérieur, uh, it's chosen by politics, but it's most of the time uh, the people cho chosen like this are not uh, having a major uh, role in, in judicial review, so it's not much of a problem. Uh, I still move. <laughs> um, well, I was, of course, uh, agree with uh, everything you said, um, especially about the public interest. Um, but uh, the question of who defines the public interest <laughs> is, of course, <laughs> the most interesting. I think that probably, but please don't say that in France, or I, I, <laughs> I cannot go back to my work on Monday. Um, I think that the Conseil d'État is considering that he is the state, and it is defining itself what the public interest should be. Uh, but this is not a good answer, I <laughs> understand that. But I think that, uh, well, this is uh, probably the only one I can give. Um, thank you, uh, Kiros, about what you said. I, of course, uh, was uh, agree with everything. And I was thinking, hearing uh, you, that um, probably in case of a, a massive nuclear attack, uh, nothing will survive except uh, maybe some insects and maybe the Conseil of l'État <laughs> because <laughs> it survived everything <laughs> and uh, th that's well, that's proved uh, it's very well adapted to almost everything but uh, uh, okay <laughs> um, um, Professor Craig who left oh, so <laughs> I will <laughs> <okay. laughs> take that for uh, later on um I'm not going to answer everything, I'm sorry, it's uh, not uh, taking very precise, not on, on. But I was very interested in what you said about the fact that you are focused on the individual acts, just like in the German system, in fact, because, well, when you uh, asking the act to be uh, a problem, not only for legal, in legal terms, but also for uh, someone, uh, right, it, it's also like, most likely, individual acts. And I think this is the main difference between our systems, because the um, French system was really built on uh, the general act mm -hmm. and not the individual. Yeah. And it, it's still, I think, a, a, a big difference, even if we are now taking in account uh, more precisely uh, uh, individual uh, Aspects. I, I think it, it's still the main difference uh, between our system and that proof that uh, there are definitely at least uh, two kind of continental uh, yeah. judicial review uh, way of things. But uh, we are now uh, more and more uh, doing uh, differences between the way we are uh, doing a judicial review on individual acts and judicial review on uh, general acts. Uh, for example, there were uh, last week, last uh, uh, Friday, uh, uh, a new um, ruling, an arrêt d'assemblée. It means that it's uh, the most important yeah. uh, uh, way of giving the Conseil d'État. Decided that before the uh, uh, General Act, uh, you cannot examine uh, uh, the question about uh, what we call uh, legalité externe which is uh, procedural uh, problems, mm -hmm. uh, after two months, and it's over. Even if you are now, after you attack an individual act, founding on the general one, you cannot attack the, the procedural aspects. So uh, we uh, progressively divide our control mm -hmm. into different ways, I think. But well, it's yeah. work in progress, so yeah. I'm not very sure of what I'm saying, but I think that we are <coughs> going to have very, two very different ways of seeing uh, our judicial review, in the general act on, one, on the one hand <coughs> and the other on the general act. So I think that's 
probably one of our uh, goals for the next uh, uh, years. Uh, I would like uh, just uh, to say to Professor Craig, who is back, <laughs> um, that um, I do agree with the difference uh, one can see when you are reading uh, a ruling in, of the Conseil d'État and a, a, a ruling of a, an English church. But I think that uh, you have to also to take in account that the, the French Conseil d'État ruling are not uh, just the ruling. You also have to take in account les conclusions of the rapporteur public. And I think that um, the obsession of uh, a, a French lawyer for, for written law and the fact that we uh, don't have, well, we didn't have uh, an administrative written law uh, for uh, almost two centuries um, explain that difference. It's because we conceive the ruling itself as a kind of written law. Uh, and we are uh, having uh, the old explanation, the uh, old questioning about uh, other way of seeing uh, an issue in the conclusions. But the ruling itself, it, it's a kind of law, in fact, I think for us. And that may be explained the, the, the difference you, you. In the conclusion uh, of the. How about the week? Okay. Um, now, we're about to week before a commissaire du gouvernement. Yeah. So, maybe that's a, a, an explanation of that difference. So, the, the ruling are maybe quite brief, uh, probably <coughs> nowadays not that brief, but uh, they used to be very brief, but because it's just a kind of uh, uh, loop, uh, and well, I think that's uh, the explanation. May I uh, intervene? If you have finished, may yeah, I yeah, 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 intervene to, to what I just said, or the time is? May well, I? Should, should we go to this? Yes, uh, say a few words. Uh, the, the, the first thing uh, I wanted to just to comment uh, upon is exactly what you said at the end. We have to understand how a decision of the Conseil d'État is uh, taken, which is a very expensive, luxurious procedure. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it is a, as luxurious as it was when I lived it, because I lived it uh, uh, in the, the 80s. But someone uh, is in charge of the case. He belongs to a subsection of the section du contentieux. The, the section du contentieux, the section of uh, of the litigation has nine subsections. Ten. How, how many? Ten. Ten. Ten subsections. One he gets the case. A uh, middle career uh, who has the grade, the middle grade, the commissaire du gouvernement, but he is one of the best. The best of them are chosen to be, uh, uh, vous, uh, how do you call them now? Rapporteur public. Rapporteur public. <laughs> Uh, they used to be called uh, historically Commissaire du Gouvernement, mm -hmm. but now it gives a bad impression. It's more neutral. Rapporteur public. Now, this rapporteur public works independently from anyone else, and he studies the case, and he writes a report. And then the one who is in charge of the case, if I'm not wrong, and the rapporteur public, they go to the sub to the subsection. Is that correct? And and uh, another. Uh and the third one, uh, which, they go to the uh, uh, subsection and they discuss the case. I have been there, I have seen that. They discuss the case, they, they come to a conclusion. Then they mix up with a second subsection. Mm -hmm. So two of them come together and they discuss the case on the uh, uh, introduced by the first. Uh, subsection. The first subsection discusses the case with the second. And they conclude. And when they conclude, what happens? It's well, finished? It, it's finished. It's finished. The Unless it goes to the general, is it yes. to the in plenary? In front of the old section or in front of the uh, uh, Right. So this is a very luxurious. And when we say that uh, 
the, uh, the decisions are very brief. This is wrong because the decision is not in what is published, but is in the rapport, in the report of uh, uh, the Commissaire du Gouvernement, the, the, the rapporteur, <laughs> I'm not used to say that, the rapporteur public. So, the, um, uh, in the English tradition, everything is in, in the decision. But uh, uh, in, the, in the Conseil d'État decision, only the, the essential, the very, very, very essential, which is the decision. Can I, can I just, <laughs> in the spirit of dialogue, um, uh, just have a, a comment on this? Let me just be a little bit provocative. I mean, <laughs> Friday afternoon, I mean, we can be provocative. Um, so, uh, I did understand that. I did understand the role of the Conseil de Gouvernement, uh, reporter. <laughs> um, uh, I understand that. Um, I think there's two points I would make. I think it's still significant that what is in the formal decision is still brief. And you may have all the kind of arguments you want behind closed doors, or you might have all the arguments you want of a more normative nature in somebody else's conclusion, but it's still that's deliberate that the formal decision is still exiguous and relatively short and stripped down, as it were. That's the first point. Uh, and so that's a conscious choice for a legal system, deciding to do it that way. Mm -hmm. It's not fortuitous. The second point, and so this is, that wasn't provocative. This, <laughs> okay. is, this is provocative. This is the bit which is provocative, which is, I don't understand why. I mean, why? What? I mean, I've always wondered, okay, so you're taking, it's a bit like you're saying, uh, let's take a relatively smart junior barrister or senior barrister and say, right, you go off and do the hard thinking about this as an independent person and we're going to, we're going to uh, treat your conclusions with a great deal of respect and then we'll negotiate with you uh, as to how we integrate this into our final decision. I under, and that seems to me what's in effect going on. Now, I have great respect for the intellect of, uh, of the people who are doing this. Nonetheless, there's part of me that stands back and says, why? Yeah. Why? I mean, why, why, is this, why is this a particularly good... In other words, if you were dropped down from Mars and you were designing a legal system now, <laughs> why would you come up with that? You know, I mean, why is that particularly... Uh, I mean, w w what are the benefits of doing it in that way? I said it was provocative. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, I but not personally, <laughs> but just institution. I did not no, no, I, I, because in my, in my second uh, point, it's that the answer to him. <laughs> no, I, I would just uh, like to respond that uh, well, when we you are written a law, you are not putting in the law well. We decided these because these and because these and you just say okay this is the law and that's all and that's why the the, the Conseil d'État ruling are made for this is the law and that's all so you don't need to explain why why not why not all the circumstances you just have to say the law but is there but something you, you, in in respecting government and if what your level of authority is the more authority you have the less you need to explain. Yeah, I think that's what <laughs> Dutch judges think. The more we explain, uh, the less our authority is. Yeah, there is. <laughs> but, but, but it seems, but just, just on that basis, it seems to me. So, just on that, I, I appreciate your your response, and my response is I understand and just think, accept that that's. I don't. I don't by the normative foundations of that. It seems to me courts are institutions of power within society. They're making choices. I think other things being equal, I'd like transparency as to the choices that are being made and the reasons which are infecting or infusing that choice. Now the fact that you say, uh, I understand, I understand the way you put it, you put it very clearly, you know, that's the law, boom, that's it. You know, go away and obey and all that. <laughs> um, but uh, my view is 
that I think citizens need to be treated with, with as grown-ups and with respect, and they need to understand the kind of normative arguments which are feeding in to the conclusions which are reached, and that they can then see, okay, all right, well, I either agree with that or I don't agree with that, but I can see why it went that way. But, but everything is in the conclusion of the rapporteur public, yeah, but and that, they are but, public. But, but, the, the, but then my point, that comes back to my other point, is why? Why, why this person? Why this individual? Why, why invest this yeah, person? Nice. So we, look, we're the so Conte d'Etat, and we said, no, George, you're you really smart. He is really smart. <laughs> I supervised his doctorate. He's really smart. <laughs> said, you're really smart. We've got this really difficult case. You go and write the conclusions, and then we'll, we'll negotiate with you. And then I think, okay, that's great. But why don't we all write the conclusions? <laughs> well, don't get excited, dear yeah, Paul, because there are uh, answers to uh, your rhetoric. And um, uh, the, uh, the point is this. The uh, recours pour excès de pouvoir uh, uh, is uh, uh, developed in, uh, as part of uh, the French administration. And up to when I was student, one of the characteristics of uh, uh, the uh, administration in France or in Greece was le secret administrative. Openness of the administration is moderate. In uh, when I was taught, I was taught le secret administrative. The, the administration does not talk to everybody. It does not open to everybody. So that's the environment into which the system uh, 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 developed. And it developed also on the basis of two principles, which is which are very important. First, it is an inquisitorial system, not adversarial. The judge has uh, the duty to find the truth, and he can open all the files of the world, and he has the duty to find the truth because you have two litigants, one of them who knows everything, that's public administration, they have the fight, and the other uh, who the, suspects that there, there is something wrong for him in there. In the. So this other had not historically, up to very recently, access to the fight, and, but the judge would have the access to the fight in this system two centuries now. So, and the procedure is written. That's the second thing. Uh, the, so, the, um, the pleadings are of uh, lesser importance. Yes, I understand. Uh, so, if you have a coincidental system and you have a, a written procedure and uh, you have the history of being part of the administration, then you develop a system and if you are happy with it, you don't change it. Of course, this is not understood by others, but uh, the reason is that perhaps not others, others develop better than you, but you are very happy with what you have developed, and I believe it, it is very well developed. Now, there is the advantage of this system as compared with yours. No, 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 I'm talking uh, scientifically, I'm not talking. Uh, the advantage is that uh, for you, discovery is an issue. For them, it is just that you suggest to the judge, please look, and he will find that. But for, I believe that the, 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 the weak point of the system of this country is the, is the discovery. Uh, you, you, you have to develop with more inquisitorial powers, uh, and they will, you, I think you will, I to the agree, judges. I don't agree with that. Two more. Uh, 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 two, this is getting really two, <laughs> two more things. Uh, Thomas Gross spoke of uh, the uh, incremental character of the German system up to the German uh, basic law. Eh? Now, I want to, to, to remind everyone that this is the characteristic of the administrative law in every country. 
before the Second World War, in every country, the tradition, in every one, in France, the tradition was an, a, in, uh, the fragmentation of, uh, in this country, you had how many administrative tribunals? They were not organized as they are now in the system. Ad hoc answers to ad hoc problems. The same in France. We talk of the Conseil but there were tens or perhaps hundreds of special administrative courts. From what I know in, uh, uh, in the Netherlands, I in Greece, yeah. And uh, it is after the Second World War that the organization of justice started uh, uh, imitating, copying the traditional justice system and uh, building up as they did. Now, I will say one more word and finish. The, <laughs> That's good. Yeah, yeah, finish, finish, finish. <laughs> the, uh, if it's true, though. I, uh, the problem of French administrative law is that after the Second World War, the Germans started from scratch, in fact, and uh, redoing the system. They have been galloping because they are free of history. They're free of history. And perhaps the same could happen here. Because at a certain moment, uh, your judges uh, be freed themselves from history. The French system is too heavy in history. And they are doing also big reforms in the last years, which they were developed. But uh, never forget the history and the fact that it works for them. It works for them. Like mm. <laughs> if something's worked for 800 years, it hasn't yet caused a major catastrophe. If it ain't broken, don't fix it. That's right. It's a perfectly rational basis. <laughs> yes, I want to say something. Yeah. May I? Yeah. Just for... No, 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 please, please. Just for one minute. Uh, it took 14 minutes to Professor Flovetis to justify um, in, in, in very reasonable manner, in a very reasonable manner, what is happening in, in uh, within the French Conseil d'État? To explain, to explain, to identify. <laughs> However, <laughs> I had the uh, I had the honor and privilege 20 years ago to <coughs> to make a stage, a summer stage within the Conseil d'État, and I asked the very same question that Professor Craig uh, just asked. And the, the, the response was much simpler by all of, of the conseillers. It's a matter of authority. We need to impose our authority. We do not need to impose anything else but authority. And this is the tradition of the Conseil d'État. It's the authority which stems from the Conseil d'Ivoire. But this is not self-sufficient. This is the answer. For three reasons, in my eyes, I'm a defender of the uh, common law jurisdiction for three reasons. The first reason is that this is a total curtailment of the individual character of the body. You need to give some prevalence to the people. You cannot just make this sort of um, a melting pot. This is a melting, the concept that there is a melting pot. You just put it in and you just fix something that could in a Procrustean way, just take all opinions and make a very short statement out of all these individual opinions. The second uh, objection is you need some substantive legitimacy. It's a matter of legitimacy. The judicial decision does, have, does not have a, a direct legitimacy. It's, on, it's not a conceptual legitimacy. The legitimacy is the decision itself. If you don't have a very articulate decision, then you don't have substantive legitimacy. And the third reason is very simple in one word. It's reason. Reason. It's a matter of reason to have this sort of deliberative judgment. You need to have the argument, the counter-argument, and the response. We're missing this. We just see the response without the deliberation, in, my, in our eyes, at least. So, I'm sorry for this. To me, if, uh, I have mixed feelings. <laughs> So uh, I, 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 I agree with David Feldman that uh, each of us is a child of uh, his or her own 
the legal tradition so uh, each tradition has uh, its uh, peculiarities and characteristics. Years ago, when I was younger and less prudent, in, in one of the meetings of our group, I made some remark public in the debate about these sort of uh, things. And the then vice president of the Conseil d'État, the Noir de Saint Marc, took the floor to say that il n'y a, a pas qu'une voie pour euh, arriver au, au règne de la loi. There's more than one way to arrive to the rule of law. So, and I think, I think he was basically right. Having said that, let me come to, uh, to Paul Craig's objection because it's, uh, it's an important one. And let me retort it. Do you think that common law judges in, in, uh, in the Supreme Court or higher courts in, in, uh, in Britain, do they try to persuade each other when they are debating after hearing a case? As much as, apparently, their French colleagues do. Or, or to put it in a different way, the fact that you can deliver a plurality opinion, does it weaken the uh, potency, the potentiality of a court to arrive at one single recent collective decision? Because, because probably, and I'm surprised that none of you have raised that, that uh, aspect of the question. In many uh, civil law countries, for ordinary people to think that, even if it is false, but for many people to think that if this is not the only possible right solution, it is the best possible solution, that is an important thing in terms of legitimacy instead of having or installing ourselves in a sort of a, a permanent divided courts that uh, 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 take decisions according to their own uh, backgrounds. Uh, but so Louise, I mean, I, I think just, um, I, I think you put, you put the point well and you put it forcefully, <coughs> but I think it's, it's certainly not um, it's not directed to the kind of argument I was trying to put on the table. I'm not trying to make the case for any uh, a priori advantage of um, courts giving single opinions versus well, multiple no, opinions. No, no, but I'm a strong defender of it. But but, I, but 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 my point, my point was really not, nothing to do with whether. W with the relative advantage of single opinions versus multiple opinions. My two points were, I had two points. One was, if you're going to have a single opinion, it was, my point was the same as George's, which is other things being equal, I'd like to see, I think that we, in order to imbue the decision with substantive legitimacy, need to know the kind of reasoning which informed the conclusion and the kind of arguments which weighed with the court not just a bare postage stamp saying this is the rule. That was my first point. So that, uh, and, and that's perfectly consistent with having one judgment. It's just the nature of the judgment you produce. My second point was still, I'm still, <laughs> with respect, mystified <laughs> as to the why this particular person called the Commissaire du Gouvernement uh, is invested with the role and authority which he or she is invested with. I simply, the, I mean, I'm really, look, I really am trying to sh loosen my own shackles of my own heritage and birth, but I cannot, for the life of me, quite see why. I mean, Gordon's fantastic, and he's great, but, you know, if he was the junior member of the court, why would you necessarily pick that one person and say, right, we're now going to give you, you know, we're now going to invest you with the aura and authority which comes from being this person and, and having this role, rather than a more senior member of the court. I mean, I can't, I mean, that's what I can't quite get my head around. But there might be all sorts of reasons for that, and the reasons may be different in different jurisdictions. I mean, speaking not so much as a, 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 as a 
British lawyer, but having had experience of working in the civil system, uh, the civil constitutional court, uh, and I say, you know, nothing I say should be taken to cast any aspersions at all on the abilities of my former colleagues as judges of the Constitutional Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina. But! But! <laughs> <laughs> one reason for giving a significant amount of, of, of uh, power effectively to members of what there is, is the registry, and I think the similar arrangements can be found in, in the Strasbourg Court, is if you're not awfully confident in the ability of your judges to work it out for themselves, you know, the, the stronger, in terms of legal intellect and judgment, you think your judges are, the less pragmatic use of there is to give that sort of authority to the registry. Secondly, caseload. The larger the caseload, the less, perhaps, likely it is that the individual judges themselves or judges collectively are going to be able to do the work it up from the, from, from the ground that's needed in each case to deal with, with the caseload or the caseload of the people they did And we were dealing with a caseload of about 5,000 cases a year during the time I was there quite impractical for nine judges to deal with, three of whom are part-time to deal with. Deal with. Uh, you've got to do a lot of reliance, a lot of reliance to, to other people. And then you're left with a system where there has to be some sort of faith placed in a process of dialogue between the, effectively the, 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 the case management lawyers and the judges. So that, that, that's one set of things. But that doesn't apply so much in, in the domestic system, in, a, in our domestic system. But I'd like also to, to turn it around and, uh, uh, and question, as, as Louise was questioning, just how transparent the common law system really is. Uh, there have been some interesting uh, studies done, particularly by Alan Patterson, of, of how the judges work in the old House of Lords in the court. And it is very interesting, you know, the conclusions like that the, 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 they come out of court, they have an immediately a, 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 a deliberation, deliberation session where they simply go round the table and say who's going to go one way, who's going to go the other way, who's going to start by trying to draft a, 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 an opinion for the majority of the then someone is given the job and, and they go off and start. But other judges can preempt the system by producing their own judgment first. And Lord Hoffman was very good at that. Lord, Lord, Lord Bingham was very good at that. And, and just write it very quickly. Lord Hoffman had an advantage over Lord Bingham because Hoffman worked straight on to word processor. Whereas Bingham wrote long hand <laughs> and then had to wait for it to be typed by the Lord's uh, uh, secretaries. So he tend, so whoever gets their draft out first has an advantage in persuading the others. Who's going to say oh, this looks perfectly reasonable to me? If I disagree, do I disagree strongly enough to make it work <coughs> worth putting the effort in to write myself? Well, Perhaps not. Um, all sorts of other pressures. Uh, the more controversial a case is, perhaps, the more likely a political controversial, the more pressure is likely to be brought to bear by whoever's presiding to maintain as far as possible a united front. <coughs> you don't want people going off in all directions. I, mean, I, 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 I dread to think, but I actually know how much time left was put in before the, uh, the Miller judgment was handed down the Supreme Court to try to persuade the three dissenters to come into line. And that's the negotiation process as well too. And in the process of trying to bring people in on board for a, a single judgment, all sorts of compromises get made. You know, someone says, well, I'll, 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 uh, I'll come in 
equity more this, but not if that paragraph stays in, the paragraph comes out. And, 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 and that's also true at the level of getting a majority for a particular judgment in, in, in a divided court where there's one opinion, with one you know, the, the, the opinion of the court. Uh, and, and that is part of, I think, why many of the Strasbourg judgments look so odd, you know, and sometimes five obvious gaps in the reasoning. And usually, particularly if you read the, <coughs> the, 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 the separate opinions, you realise it's a problem <coughs> for that purpose. Okay. Those are the sort of things, you know, if, if we're going for unanimity or even consensus, it makes it much more difficult to produce judgments that make coherent sense. And I can see great advantages if you're a multi judge tribunal dealing with these cases all the time in not trying to construct detailed reasons and say, well, yeah, this is what we decide, here are some reasons which you can find in the conclusions of, 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 of the. Um, uh, oh. <laughs> of the um, uh, and uh, 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 the fact that you have your the institutional authority of the court to make your judgment without people being able to pick away from the sin. It's, uh, there are all sorts of reasons for doing things. I'm not sure that's very helpful. So. <coughs> but I think everyone's right. <laughs> Should we come back to Gordon and then? If you have to. Um, <laughs> uh, one question in relation to the discussion and which court do we prefer, the Court of Justice or the Court of Human Rights, in terms of its approaches to judgments? Um, That's a good question. Uh, the DPP was also a good question. Uh, I'll start by answering. George drew the distinction between principle and pragmatism. Pragmatism is a nice way of saying we're lazy and I'm just English. Uh, in the common law system sometimes. Probably the DPP, DPP what is the DPP? Uh, Director of Public Prosecutions. All right. The Director of Public Prosecutions exercises power, power independently, but it is subject to the Attorney General. And that's, also, that's true in England and Wales. It's also true in Northern Ireland. And of course, the Attorney General is the government's legal advisor, so you're probably right that I shouldn't have described it in those terms. Um, it's also the case that the Director of Public Prosecutions and Courts have historically taken a very, very hands-off approach to reviewing their decisions. Um, I think less so, but uh, uh, there are more, more and more challenges being brought forward, but, but generally it occupies a, a unique place, so uh, I'll skip on quickly. Um, on expert evidence, uh, and I think this comes back, uh, Paul made a point about uh, common law rulings being laced with policy preferences and norm of choices. Um, I do think in some cases where, where there's expert evidence, uh, medical decisions, for example, the courts absolutely step back from second guessing uh, the decisions of medical experts or, or decisions about the allocation of medical resources. They'll justify with reference to the expertise of the doctors, but really the policy consideration is the polycentricity of, of resource allocation. Uh, so the courts don't want to uh, intervene in one case when it'll have implications for parties outside. But there are other cases where the courts will look closely at expert evidence, environmental cases. Um, I think the courts will drill down into the information and form of view about uh, those issues. So uh, it's probably. More, more, more complex and, uh, than a straightforward approach. Your point about judicial populism I thought was very interesting. First of all, I don't know how you measure You said that you have a concern that uh, courts are being influenced by social media, by debates. I don't know how you measure that. Uh, the obvious example in the UK was the enemies of the people at the time of the Brexit judgment, when, the, when all, all the courts did was genuinely, you know, okay, there are debates about whether or not it was the correct application of the principles, but it was, uh, true to legal reasoning and they, they were harangued the Supreme Court when it started its Brexit judgment, the first thing it said, or sorry, when it started the Brexit case, uh, the first thing it said was essentially we're not going to be crowd cloud by uh, abuse out and about and it, and it gave a judgment that um, well, wasn't popular. 
Uh, George, um, a hobby horse of mine, when you said about principle and pragmatism, and um, again I'm disappointed Sir John Laws isn't here because you, you give the example of uh, Wednesbury unreasonableness, the best example of use of pragmatic use of language in the common law, uh, and Sir John Laws christened it as the root concept of the common law, is abuse of power. Because can somebody please explain to me what abuse of power means? Not, not, not in the... Not, uh, not like the term of the words, it's an, extreme, it's, it's an extremely broad, it's just used, uh, well, legally, maybe, isn't it? It's, it's used by, um, but that's, that's another example. But oh. it's the equivalent of what Carlos used to say that, unlike other musical movies, the way that Mr. Justice Macphers used to say, the big question is. When you saw this, did you give a long, low whistle? <laughs> you gave a long, low whistle, it's unreasonable. <laughs> and or an abuse of power. Uh, yeah. Which is good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. You know. So that's pragmatism at its best or its worst, George. Uh, on, on, the, on the question of the remedies and your approach to annulment, as you explain those, um, my instinct is those are all things that can be done in the common law system as well. So. You give the example of quashing a decision and it can't be revisited. Um, here, I suppose, what would happen what could happen is it would be quashed, so it's void up an issue, and there may be a declaration alongside that would in effect say that that's that's never going to be a runner because the quashing order merely sets it at not the declaration can be more specific about the legal circumstances. It can be quashed and go back and be taken again. And the other point about the breach of procedure or the failure to give reasons wouldn't make any difference. Again, that's pretty familiar. It's, it's, it's rarely used by the courts, but the courts will sometimes say, a nice phrase they use sometimes is they say, there's no point in beating the earth by making the decision maker go back and take the decision when it's self-evident that we've taken it in the same way. So I, I thought those points probably can be found in ours as well. I, on the, uh, Professor Karkalis, the, the point about uh, uh, the, the convergence of legal systems and whether or not there's something new going on. Um, in one of the early editions of the European Review of Public Law, there was a, there was a brilliant article called uh, uh, The Confluence of Legal Traditions, which looked at some of those issues. <coughs> uh, but my own view is that that's been overtaken again by ideas of constitutional pluralism and, and if you want to fashion Brexit, even as, as an outbreak in constitutional pluralism, I suspect that uh, uh, the systems are all still ref self-referencing and are going to continue to be. Whether that's good or bad, I don't know. Um, and the final point that I would address was the interesting point about in Holland, where you said that there's a duty to give reasons for individual acts, but there's no duty to give reasons for general acts. And I do think that something like the Dover and Kent, Dover and Kent case is probably fits more with the, the duty to give reasons for general acts because the act, the, the application for judicial review was brought by a local council, mm -hmm. which would have been representing its localised interests. And, and on my reading of that, that case, it has gone towards saying, well, in those sorts of cases, then there, there, is, a, there is a duty. The fair, fairness is very much about the individual. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you talk about transparency as, as the foundational value for a duty to give reasons, that lends itself <coughs> uh, more to a duty to give reasons for general acts. Thanks for Nothing to work with. <laughs>
and from the expert decision of the judges, law is more effective, it's unbelievably more effective, it's less democratically legitimized, and sometimes it can be explosive. So that is the description I'd like to make as contribution to what I have so far. Okay. But then, I think this is a very brief reflection on that. I think that, I mean, that's a terrific example um, of what's going on in Greece. And I knew a bit about this just because I've got had until recently a very clever Greek doctor student. <coughs> the thing <theme> is, <coughs> uh, economic demand for the union and the effects on the United States and that kind of stuff. Um, but I think the point you're making about, which is a really interesting point and an important one, about the way in which courts can act as intermediate bodies which legitimate and transform a decision taken by a body like the Troika, which is preeminently a political transnational type of body, and then, as it were, import that decision and legitimate it within the particular national system, albeit doing so by giving constitutional authority within that system independently of a, a, a democratic choice within that system. I think it's a very, it's a very uh, uh, important point about which courts, which a uh, very important point about the way in which courts are often forced to function as a result of the exigencies produced by the financial crisis. If, if I may just add what my personal feeling, which if I have the chance, I will not transform it into a personal and political praxis, is uh, that the court should say, no, we will not decide on this. This is not a, a case of an act of an element. You are asking us to endorse or to dismiss a very complicated line of arguments, figures, uh, projections. So do your job and let us do our job. Okay, but then, I mean, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't do it. It just seems to me then, I understand what your sentiment, but, and I'm not saying I disagree with it, I just think I have to think about that in more, more detail. But Thank you. when the court declines jurisdiction, which is what you're asking it to do. No, 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 I did not say that. I said, look, uh, <coughs> if the uh, care of uh, a human is not touched, or the care of a constitutionally heavily protected procedure is not touched, the rest is not for us to judge. Not too much uh, proportionality, uh, because through the mechanisms of proportionality, and it's not the usual proportionality which we know from Strasbourg or from wherever, but uh, and there are all sorts of political choices. Uh, in, in, in numbers like in torrent, in, in numbers that they, you, you can hardly imagine. And then, uh, for good or for bad, rather for good, our courts have admitted this fraud. And they say, okay, that's constitutional, so everybody says it's not our decision. It's them that mm -hmm. Yes. I, I, I would just like to address to this problem of the scope of intervention of the administrative courts because at first when we when we thought about administrative law we thought about um, a body a public body that was bound to the law that was the principle of legality and so according to the portuguese system that it is very similar to the the french one portuguese courts can only control the legality of the procedure, the legality that allowed a public body to decide about a given question. But can the administrative courts judge and rule about the merits of the political decision that is behind the administrative acting? That is the question that I, I think that we should ask. Because when a politician, a member of the government, decides if a bridge should be built in a place or another place, 
could the administrative courts judge that political decision if the decision was under the law was by, uh, was um, was respecting the law well i believe that that was one of the questions that the portuguese constitutional court also started to think about the implement of the memorandum of understanding uh, during the procedure of uh, financial and economic support. Because actually, I think that that memorandum is illegal according to European law. Independently of the juridical nature of the memorandum of understanding, it violates the principle of legal certainty, it violates the principle of equality, it violates the principle of proportionality. Of course, according, according to the photo frost jurisprudence of the European Court of Justice, national courts cannot review the legality of an European act. So what can the national courts do? <coughs> well, they can just judge the implementation of European law by the national law. But the problem is, can an administrative judge decide if the government has acted well or bad on the merits? Well, of course, that is, I, I believe that it is the part of general principles, because when we talk about discretionary powers, we tend to think that public administration has the power to do this or that, because the law gives it that power of that margin of discretion. But is this margin of discretion unlimited? No, it isn't, because it is bound to general principles of impartiality, of proportionality, and that gives an instrument to judges in order to judge. I recall uh, also a case law from the European Court of Justice that was, I believe, from the Technische Universiteit of München, uh, that was a case where there was a, a periscope that was bought by the university and it was bought in Japan uh, but it, and there was a, a claim for the tax authorities in Germany that there was a similar technology in Netherlands that sold that kind of, uh, how do I call it? It's, uh, it's to see in the space. It's it's a not a microscope. It's a telescope. A telescope in order to see oh, the stars and in order <laughs> to make a space observation. And so there was a dis uh, discussion if it was or not tax free because if it was bought in the in the European Union, it was possible. Uh, it was not possible to benefit from a tax uh, benefit. And so the court said that it had no power to say if the telescope was or not scientifically similar, but that the procedure of choice of the experts that said that, that the telescope of Netherlands was similar to the Japan, that procedure was not respecting the due process of law because it did not, the, the experts that granted the opinion were not specialized in that science. So the court tried to normativize, to juridify that kind of judgment. But I just, I, am, I have some curiosity, what is the extent that a common law court or a civil law court can exercise judging and reviewing those kind of political decisions uh, based on merits. Uh, in Portugal, it's very difficult to do that because Portuguese courts can only control the legality, not the merits of the political decision. Of course, what you regard as legality is something that's an interesting question. Uh, I would like to link our discussion with the doctrine of separation of powers mentioned in the first question. Uh, I think um, the ideal uh, distinction is between legislative decisions to be taken by a parliament in a free public debate based on value judgments. The only framework uh, is 
human rights or other constitutional concepts, but the very idea is that political choice is more or less free in a parliament and should not be uh, infringed by, by any judge. Um, on the other side, we have judicial decisions in the court which should be taken on the basis of the written law or uh, the common law and which should be based on arguments. Arguments derived from the written law, uh, arguments based on a method methodology developed by, by the legal science and which are not free, which are not questions of free choice, but which are implementations of decisions taken by uh, the, the lawmakers. Um, and the executive power takes decisions which are sometimes more closely to legislation, for example, in the field of delegated legislation. And, and, and the German doctrine is also that delegated legislation is a political issue. German judges always never interfere with the delegated legislation of, of national government or, or, or regional governments. This is seen as a political business. And on the other side, we have individual decisions by the administration. In, 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 in that case, our doctrine is very, uh, 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 very developed. And, we, and this is more like, like a, a judicial decision. We look very closely uh, that is developed uh, from the written law. Uh, and I think the main problem of, of the situation in Greece or in Portugal is that your parliament was not free to decide because it was not only bound by the constitution but also by the, uh, what, what the European institutions required. So your parliament was in the position of an administrative authority implementing uh, a foreign, uh, foreign will. That, that's the core of the problem, I think. There's still an opportunity, is there not, for domestic law to say, well, this particular way of implementing it was, it, it was uh, chosen without proper regard to relevant considerations, or uh, certainly the, the principles of administrative law are still operative at that level, but not at the point of the original decision to impose the obligation. Yes, if, if I may, actually in one decision the Portuguese Constitutional Court even uh, stated and declared that he accepted the standards, the European standards made by the European program, but there, but there were some alternatives that were not being considered by the legislative power. So it was totally admissible under Portuguese constitution to adopt other measures that would not be so harmful to some uh, parts of the society, of the Portuguese society. The, 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 that approach which yeah. uh, the <coughs> general principles on yeah. for, for the way discretion is exercised it, it, it is quite common in, in, in the common law as well as in the, throughout the world. In a civil context, uh, civil law context, let's not forget that legal processing and legal reasoning is usually a way that it has to be adjusted to a legal rule, which means that there are specific conditions. The judge uh, has to reply to the legislator. He just has the rule in front of him. Uh, in a common law context, that would be different. So uh, in, uh, in the case that, uh, of the Greek uh, crisis, the Portuguese crisis, um, what happened was that there was an action for annulment, which, uh, by the way, had specific uh, um, challenges for specific administrative acts. And uh, the, the margin of appreciation for the court to go and uh, decide on its own motion for specific issues was, not, was a very small possibility. The, the basic idea was that the court should decide on specific reasons, um, and this is what it did, more or less. Um, and this is a problem of the, 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 the procedure that uh, an action for an element has to follow. 
I'm very curious to know how would it be from a common law perspective. I mean, how would a judge in common law would react in such a situation? Because the margin of appreciation in a civil uh, law tech uh, context would be is, is, is very uh, limited. I, I, certainly in terms of, of, of reasoning, I mean, I, I think the approach that judges take is very much at large. I mean, I, I had, I had a, 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 very, uh, a very good student a year or so ago from a civil law jurisdiction who was struggling to get to grips with the way that common law judgments are framed. And he said, you know, where is the operative part of the judgment? Very often in, 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 a, in a law report in this country, you never know what order the court actually made because you get a, you get the reasoning, but often not what the order is. <coughs> it's very odd, uh, so, so, where are the rules that tell you what types of reasoning are acceptable and, and in, in what way you need to structure, the, what the judge needs to structure the judgment? in order to get to a decision that I said, well, actually, you don't have any rules like that. Mm. And he said, call this a legal system. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> it's much more a matter of, of what you could persuade the judge to do, I think, than, than, than anything that's governed by pre-existing rules. And, um, the, 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 the judgment can turn not so much into a statement. And I, I love the way it's, it's the civilians so far today who have talked about legal science. I don't think any of the common lawyers yeah. mentioned the words legal science. Um, and, and I'm not sure that we regard it as a science, particularly. <coughs> it's, it's more of a persuasive art. <laughs> and, uh, that is a big difference, you know, in, in, in that you, in, if you're in a system where you have to shoot all what you want to do within a certain structure of, of uh, authority and argumentation, it's much more difficult to be flexible and creative and, 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 than if you have this, you know, oh, let's play it by ear. Can I be just a little bit provocative? <laughs> what would you find if there was a collective court composed by three judges and the judge that would report the judgment would invoke the Old Testament in order to say that a woman that was beaten by his husband, her husband and her um, how do I say, and uh, her lover at the same time because she tricked his husband but she al also tricked his lover and so the two they got together and they beat it, the, the poor woman out and then there was a, a court in Portugal that judged this crime, this domestic violence crime and the man was the, the two men, the husband and the wife and the lover, were dismissed from all charges because the, the judge has invoked the Old Testament saying that she got lucky. In Old Testament she would be stoned to death. And the other two judges of that collective court said, oh, I didn't read the project of the judgment. I I the just didn't done the crime. Yeah. Well, that, that, that they were. A criminal offense. Well, the other <coughs> members of the court were two women that did not read the project of the judgment because in Portugal we also have a huge caseload, and so. The problem is the legislator says that for some events there should be a collective court, for others less important that it can have um, just a single court. 
And so my problem is, Marie has assured us that in the Conseil d'État, they all uh, review the decisions, they all discuss those decisions. I am used to it also because I was advisor at the Portuguese Constitutional Court and the discussion is very uh, profound. There are dissenting votes from the judges that do not agree with part of the reasoning. But my problem is, the reasoning is also a way to prevent this kind of events. It shows all the arguments, it shows the discussions between the members of the collective court. And so this case was uh, very important in Portugal because there was a disciplinary procedure against the judges because the High Committee of the Magistrature has uh, presented a disciplinary procedure against those judges and there was a major discussion by public opinion if it was admissible that the judge would invoke the Old Testament and the other two did not even read the project of the final decision. So it's just a provocation. It is basically exact that at least at the high time of the crisis, the parliament was expected to be something like the functional equivalent of an administrative body. But this is not my main concern. My main concern is why and who needs the parliament. The Troika does not need it. But all the official documents we read you should read that human rights are respected, constitutions are respected, democracy is respected, but measures have to be implemented. Now, there are, one cannot uh, say that a contradiction is excluded. So, uh, this way <coughs> of trying to have it both ways, you will have all your procedural and substantial right, bending to whatever, but you, they were, they remain on the journey. But at the same time, also the measures, which by the way, uh, from the financial point of view, are quite logical, uh, they have to be implemented as well. So this, again, uh, uh, proved to be very effective, but at a different layer, can be also very, very explosive. That was my point. Mm. Let me jump into this. Well, <clears throat> let's start by saying that uh, I'm absolutely convinced that the English maxim, hard cases make bad law, is basically true. Mm. So, <clears throat> So, uh, I'm saying this because <coughs> when, we, when we debate problems about uh, judicial review of administrative action, or for that purpose, any other legal problem, if we focus too much on extreme, uh, uh, extraordinary, unusual, uh, tragic situations, we risk missing, uh, missing the point. Uh, so, with this, I'm not saying I'm not saying nothing, anything either in favor or against certain uh, uh, judicial decisions. I'm simply uh, checking that uh, certain uh, certain decisions are, by definition, extremely difficult and uh, essentially controversial. Secondly, and in connection to this, I do think that the problems confronted by judicial review of a legislation are not exactly the same as those uh, concerning uh, judicial review of administrative actions. So the problems of a judicial, uh, what standards of interpretation basically are admissible in one field and the other are not the same. And uh, I think that uh, for very good reasons in, in most, uh, in most uh, European countries, uh, the standards to adjudicate administrative action are uh, more stringent, more demanding, more severe than those concerning uh, the legislation, basically because of what uh, Thomas Ross said, 
because legislation is directly or some, sometimes indirectly uh, uh, done by an elected uh, body directly legitimated by, by the people uh, in an open deliberative process uh, and basically and based on, on, on uh, the balancing of, of uh, competing values. So, so this brings me to, to the point. You said, uh, may uh, an administrative court say something about a minister's decision that a bridge should be uh, built in this place? It depends on what the court says. Just to begin with, I think it is not the same thing to say, no, the bridge may not be built in this specific place the minister has chosen, as to say, it instead, be it should be built in this other place that I find more convenient, adequate, or expedient. Or closer to my home. Or whatever. <laughs> or whatever. So I think that, just to begin with, it seems to me much more uh, easily acceptable for a, a civilized uh, country to accept that the, the administrative court says, no, says, listen, here, no. It's illegal for you to decide to build the bridge in this place. For instance, because it's uh, a, an environmentally protected space. Then to say, no, instead put it uh, here. And that has much to do with the problem of remedies. And the problem of remedies in, in, in judicial review of administrative action, in my experience, has much to do with, with something that our colleague and friend Sabino Cassese has very well uh, described in, in writing. He calls it, I think, the different spheres of administrative law in different countries. There are countries with a relatively limited sphere of administrative law. Uh, the courts may only uh, annul, invalidate uh, illegal uh, decisions, whereas in other countries, that same court may uh, uh, take uh, or, or adopt or, uh, further judgments. For instance, declaring a right, giving compensation, and so on. Personally, I, in Spain, I come, I come from a country where administrative courts have both powers. The power to annul the decision and the, eventually the power to recognize, declare a, a right or a, a specific situation, including compensation. So, and uh, furthermore, one may go uh, without, not in parallel with the other, because it's perfectly possible for a court to recognize that the decision was illegal and to annul it, but not to recognize the right because uh, there's not uh, enough uh, basis for that. So I think that uh, uh, when one comes to, to the problem of what to do once one has found the, the, the decision is illegal, it, it has much to do with how that concrete legal system, either by statute or by uh, jurisprudence, has uh, designed the, the powers, the powers of, uh, of the court. And one last comment. I said it before, it's some uh, time ago, that I didn't agree with, uh, with the Spiros on one point. A, a system of judicial review, in my, in my own experience, and coming from a system of a judicial review of administrative action, basically adversarial. I think, on the whole, uh, too confident, as the French would put it, is better. In my experience, public administration, and sometimes uh, citizens, uh, private persons, lose cases before our courts, not because they were wrong, but because they didn't plead it correctly. Yeah, of course. They didn't produce the necessary evidence. Or they chose the wrong arguments to defend their case. So to what extent uh, an administrative court should be entitled to replace the litigants, either one side or the other? 
we have statutorily some very limited powers to do so. But in any case, putting the case before the, 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 the parties and asking them, listen, this case could be decided uh, according to different, uh, to different grounds, but what do you think of this? But not uh, by our own authority and without putting the, the question to the parties. Thank you. Well, I just wanted to say in the UK system, that's not a problem. So um, I don't know if it's exactly the same thing in Wales, but certainly in Northern Ireland, under the judicial review procedure, when you, up, up until the moment that you apply for it's two stages, so up until the moment you apply for a leave or the permission of the court, you can change your pleadings at any time. And then during the leave stage, the judge, if he or she is minded to do so, can point to issues that should be brought in, issues that should be left out. Um, you can also apply to the court after permission has been given to amend your pleadings. Um, again, so there's tremendous flexibility in theory and in practice in the common law system, and also the level of remedy. So uh, the, the pleadings for remedies will specify whichever particular orders, but will also include uh, or any such other relief as the court deems. Meet for what the question of yeah. is. So it's, it's, and I, actually, that's where a lot of judicial activism really happens because the courts, not, not necessarily in the reported sense, but the courts will come in and they can, they can redesign proceedings and make sure that they get a result that they think should be And also modify the outcome of the administrative decision. But depending on the remedy, I mean, uh, the, you, would argue, you, would, you would modify the question and require it to be taken again. There's only oh, there's, only, there's, one, there's one situation in England and Wales where the uh, court can replace yes, an original right. decision in the judicial review process, and that's if the original decision was a judicial decision, and it's clear on a proper understanding of the law that no other decision could have been reached. But otherwise, it, I, mean, I think that's right. But the law position is that the, the, the decision would be sent back for, for, for the making. I mean, uh, I, I, th that's absolutely right. I mean, the only caveat I'd make is that, because um, I think it is a point of contrast with some continental systems, um, we have no, we've never had any problem in issuing formal commanding orders to the administration. Mm. So, I mean, from, for 500 years, we've been issuing orders, which are not only, so we would have, it would be quite common in old-style parlance to have an order of certiorari, which would quash a determination, and then an order of mandamus, which would tell the administration what it should do instead. Um, uh, and uh, that, I mean, the court doesn't have to issue both, but it has a discretion to issue both, and, and, it, and uh, depending on the circumstances, I mean, sometimes it will just remit the case, it will just quash it, it will go back to the administration, and the administration will have another crack at it. Um, but they'll, depending on the nature of the dispute and the nature of the facts, it may well be a circumstance where the court says, well, we're quashing this, and we're telling you, you give the person the benefit that they're claiming that you deny them. I just want to say, uh, uh, in relation to orders of mandamus, it depends on the extent of the discretion, surely, that the decision... Oh, yeah, yeah, no, of course. So it's, it's, it, it only really issues in very narrow circumstances, doesn't well, it? Well, uh, it, I mean, traditionally, the, it, the more, as it were, managerial or executive the duty is, and certainly there was, certainly there was case law, older case law on mandamus saying we'll only issue in circumstances where it is a duty. <coughs> a clear duty rather than a discretion. But actually, when you read some of the case law, that line between duty and discretion gets fudged. Um, so if, it, if there's nominally a discretion, but a discretion which is de facto or de jure bounded, in inverted commas, by circumstantial facts, such that, OK, you have, a formal dis you have a discretion in formal terms, but in reality, the only outcome Given that you have quashed the decision they made, the only possible outcome now is that outcome. Then the court might well say, "Okay, do it." You know. Um. I think the question of uh, this. Uh,
saying, uh, can we replace the litigant? Uh, in, in France, uh, we are not supposed to do so because uh, we have the ultra petita uh, principle. But uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, we do so <laughs> many times um, because of, uh, uh, again, uh, probably uh, our history and, and the purpose uh, and the first purpose of the uh, judicial review, uh, which was uh, control the administration and be sure that the administration uh, is still uh, acting in the limits of, uh, of the law. So uh, we uh, traditionally see uh, the, the applicant as you know a kind of coin you put in the machine and then well we don't care about what it's <laughs> doing after we, we do our business. Um, so well we are taking the, the, the plea and well if he, the, if the litigant uh, uh, didn't see the the, the right uh, weaknesses of the act, we may help him uh, to to. Well, See it. Are a lot of your uh, a lot of your parties litigants uh, in person are unrepresented by lawyers? Well, uh, it depends on the kind of contention, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, because in the recours pour accès au pouvoir, you can uh, plead by yourself uh, alone without a legal counsel, but in other uh, areas. Uh, uh, for responsibility or for contract uh, issues, uh, you need a legal counsel. But uh, in the recours pour accès au pouvoir, uh, the litigant is, well, not very often, but uh, well, sometimes uh, alone. And of course, in, in that uh, case, uh, most of the time we just have a, you know, a sheet of paper and it's written, I'm, I'm not happy with this decision. <laughs> And we are uh, very comprehensive <laughs> to to well, look at the situation in every uh, issue we can have. What? So does EU law require courts uh, to raise points? If, if, if there's an EU law point, it's obvious to a judge that hasn't been pleaded. Does EU law not require the judge to raise that point? No. No. Not necessarily. It depends if you do the same thing with your national and domestic law. You, you have to do. You have the principle of equivalence. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's the only bound. Exactly. You, but, so the approach taken by EU is if if you are a national court and that and your national court would not be required in normal circumstances to raise a point which had not been raised by the litigants then the CJEU would not normally force you to do so where the point happens to be in the EU. Yeah. Well, I'd like to add something because we had a very theoretical approach about uh, civil law system and common law systems um, and whether you're part of the administration as a judge or not. And then I think it's uh, in the Netherlands we have a nice test case because we have three administrative uh, courts that are the highest and two are parts of the independent judiciary and one is the Council of State who is more or less part of the administration. And then we have the same theory about discretion, we have the same theory, theory about how intensive your re re review should be. But then if you look to the different courts, they, take, uh, they do take a different approach. And you see it especially how speedy the, the court procedures are. Within the Council of State, it's normally nine months. Um, within the independent judiciary, it takes about one to two years. <laughs> if you look at the success rate, you see, you see differences. You see that the Council of State is a bit more governmental friendly than the independent courts are. But then on the other hand, um, if you see when do they dare to take their own decision, and not only annul the decision, but also state what should happen or take the decision themselves, then it's especially the Council of State who takes that responsibility because they are close to administration. So you can have a whole theory for one country, but I think it differs how your, how your administrative law branch is organized, um, how you practice it. What are, what are the separation of powers and dependent judiciary that you mentioned. But if, if you look at the position of the UK, um, 
there's very little discussion of that that I know of in, in the, 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 the assumption is that we want the judiciary as a whole to be independent of other organs of state. Um, but that combined with the way in which our judges are generally selected, which is that they start off in private practice and then they, at some point in their careers they, they're appointed to the bench, means that um, on, on the one hand it, it helps them to be independent, but on the other hand it means that many of them, including quite a few of them who end up sitting in judicial review cases, uh, really have no very clear idea about what public administration is. Mm -hmm. And that has been noted as, as, a, as a growing problem because uh, uh, until <coughs> the 1960s, maybe 1970s, um, a lot of senior lawyers, particularly barristers, uh, would have uh, had a chance to sit as members of parliament. They would have been uh, part of the political process. Some of them would have been ministers and then would have gone on to the bench. And when they were dealing with uh, public law issues, they would have had a, a very clear sense of how it worked. And there used to be a, a convention with the Attorney General of the day in the judicial post the High Court became available would be a more had first refusal. Uh, uh, yeah, well, but uh, I mean, we, we now only have one judge in the High Court or above who has any experience as a parliamentary or minister, and that's Sir Ross Cranston. And I don't think we have any had experience of public administration directly, although mm -hmm. quite a few of the uh, people, the Treasury and the Devils, who do a lot of the government's legal work in the courts, go on to the bench so they at least see it. They don't work with civil servants and ministers at some point. But we have no equivalent of the sort of expertise mm -hmm. in administration, properly so called, that, 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 that you you ought to expect to have in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether this was something which was common to. to but it was a corollary, I mean, a further point um, going on from what David had just said is that, of course, that um, I guess of the structure, because we don't have a divided court system, so what it means also is that the judges who end up in the Court of Appeal and then in the Supreme Court may have come from a purely commercial law background or do shipping or, or chancery work or tax work and will not, will not during their legal careers as in practice have necessarily done any public law cases at all. I mean, they, they, and it doesn't mean they can't turn their hand to it. Some of them do so, some of them you know, transform and become really rather good public Lawyers, but it just means that they start off with a rather steeper learning curve um, because they just haven't been doing this stuff for. I mean, I mean, if you look at, at any time, if you look at the profile of the Supreme Court, you'll have some people who will have had that kind of background, um, uh, a public law background, and some will have done family law or commercial law or whatever. And then, but as I said, there, there's not, I mean, some of those, they'll be smart and they'll get used to dealing with human rights cases and that kind of thing. But that's still, it's just what our system is. And what, that, that's a just a, uh, almost the inevitable consequence of not having a divided judiciary, which means that your senior judiciary is necessarily eclectic in its composition in terms of the skill set that it brings to the table once the people get to the Supreme Court. If I may, uh, <coughs> well, uh, if uh, uh, we, we can remember once more the famous uh, 
phrase euh, « juger l'administration », c'est aussi « administrer », c'est encore « administrer uh, ».« Judging the administration » is uh, like uh, uh, « doing administration uh, you, uh, yourself uh, ». If this is true, uh, and uh, I personally am convinced that this is true, uh, it is true because uh, when you uh, decide uh, on uh, the future of uh, administrative acts, uh, you decide uh, uh, on issues of public interest. Uh, and uh, this is different from deciding on uh, issues of private uh, uh, interest. So uh, then, uh, if this is true, then the French system, uh, where they can uh, have uh, also uh, experience the judges uh, in the active administration while uh, they are judges. Of course, they cannot do both at the same time. And uh, they, um, uh, in order to avoid uh, uh, to avoid the uh, uh, um, collision with uh, the Procola case uh, uh, decision, they had to make some adjustment adjustments in, in, in their system. I believe that this system has a value. And um, I remember that uh, when I was writing uh, in 1982-83 my book, Administrative Law et Droit Administratif, I, I, I observed that uh, up to those days, practically up to Order 53, there was no such a thing in this country like being public lawyer. Was that? Well, there was in the universities. Yeah, there were professors uh, teaching constitutional and administrative law at the same time. But uh, I don't believe you had a tradition of having uh, uh, practicing lawyers or judges specializing uh, in public law. And I remember that uh, I wrote in my book in a uh, uh, footnote that uh, they are, uh, I'm sure that there will be a new era in the development of public law because a series of judges I was writing uh, who are appointed in, this, in that period of time in the court uh, have uh, uh, been uh, working for periods of time for uh, the, the, the public uh, uh, sector, I mean, uh, working for the administration. And I said, for example, Mr. Justice Wolf. You can find this footnote in my book. And because I believe that those judges, and I can cite uh, Lord Justice Wolf, uh, Lord Justice uh, Laws, uh, uh, no, no, they is from the uh, 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 Stephen Sedley. Uh, and sales uh, and uh, sorry, Stephen Sedley. Stephen Sedley. No, no, no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, the um, uh, the uh, uh, there was. I mean, they had. Uh, uh, they were. They knew the administration, and I said this. I was writing that this is a home for another kind of judges. So, uh, I mean, what you say is true, spurs, but it doesn't modify a little bit. So. I mean, you're absolutely right that there was a, the way it worked, which it worked in England at the time, and still works in this respect, still true, is that the, the, there's a, a cadre of lawyers called Treasury Juniors, and these are, these are barristers who, there's usually a panel of them now, because there's so much government work, who will be called on by the government regularly to take yeah, cases right. of judicial review on behalf of the government. And a number of them became prominent judges of the, of right. the, the people we just listed. Um, uh, John Laws being one, Harry Wolf being one, Fox Philip Sayers, Sun Brown, um, all those people. Um, uh, and they, of course, you're absolutely right, because they were doing government work and judicial review day in, day out, day in, day out, it was almost their sole occupation. They developed a, a great expertise in public law. But equally, there were a cadre of people on the other side opposing them who also specialised in public law primarily and Stephen Sedley was a, was well, a, a, a prominent example of someone who was usually, as it were, for the claimant 
and not for the government. And he and people like him also developed an expertise in public law. Um, now, part of the reason why there were fewer overall then is that for different reasons, the aggregate number of JR claims has gone up since the late or since the mid 70s. Right. So, uh, and, and that's for a whole variety of reasons. Um, and therefore, the number of claims go up, and therefore, the number of lawyers to handle that number of cases and so, uh, increases as well. And so, the, uh, the, the famous case, uh, 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 which uh, said, uh, where uh, Lord, Deni uh, L Lord uh, Diplock said that uh, there is a uh, a sep uh, what uh, was the case? The number of Riley or Riley versus McMahon. It's a jail case. It's a, a jail case. Yes. Yeah. The um, the um, uh, uh, so I want to, to, to remind you that uh, uh, being a public lawyer as a profession in this country comes after Riley versus McMahon. Do you remember that when you published your book, Administrative Law, how many books of administrative law you, uh, you had in this country? You had uh, Wade, Small, uh, Fox. The Smith. The Smith. The Smith, it was constitutional and administrative law. No, but, uh, no he had the one on judicial review. Judicial, uh, judicial, judicial review of administrative action, not administrative law. It's the equivalent. Well, in this country, it is equivalent up to now, but it is not uh, a scientifically equivalent because uh, in, this, in this issue, you are exactly where France was in uh, 1890. Well, on this exactly, see, in that, in, that respect, in that respect, we have to disagree because, I mean, I think and, and I'm, I'm, no, 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 no. I mean, we have to speak only in the sense that I think it, it is a really interesting point, and I've been thinking about it directly at the moment, so I happen to be writing a paper which entails this. Um, but I think that it entails precisely this issue as part of the inquiry. I mean, I think that if you get, th there's a really interesting issue about how you chart what criteria you take into account when deciding when a subject existed within a system, all right? Now, I, and I think that's a live issue and an interesting issue. Now, you are regarding, uh, at the moment, just in, in, in where this conversation just stopped, you are regarding the existence of a text as, as a, the A or the prime indicia of whether the subject exists. Now, um, I think that's a relevant consideration, but I don't think it's the primary consideration. I think the primary consideration is the primary materials. The primary materials being the cases and the statutes which gave rise to the litigation which then gets written about by lawyers. So I don't I think putting I think regarding the text as the primary indicia is putting the wrong thing in the driving seat. If you regard the primary case law as the principal consideration, then we're 250 years ahead of France. Um, <laughs> no, no, well, no, we had this stuff, we had real reports of real cases dating from the, uh, it really got going from the mid 16th century yeah. onwards. Well, and. We this read. Sorry? We this read. Yeah. Uh, I mean, no, I mean, and there were, and, and certainly, um, without sort of banging on about this, from statistical work I've done, once you calibrated, once you factored in population size, there were, from the, from the calculations I've done, there were as many administrative law cases in 1640 as there were <laughs> in 1975, calibrated for population size. Um, and that's only looking at reported cases. So all I'm saying is that we had a very vibrant jurisprudence of cases, and it wasn't, and, and, and again, I think that the really important thing is this, it was, and it wasn't fortuitous, and what people often 
miss in this respect. The reason why we had this, it wasn't a surprise and it wasn't haphazard and it wasn't fortuitous. We had it because at that period in the Tudors and Stuarts, we had massive amounts of state regulation. And what administrative law develops from, the disputes arise from a regulatory state. The state is regulating behavior. And the state in the Tudor and Stuart period regulated everything. I mean, the idea that we had more regulation in the 20th century than they did then is simply nonsense, um, uh, historical nonsense. And so, uh, the, the, so when people say, well, why did this all start happening then? And it started happening because the state was regulating trade, it was regulating tax, it was regulating commerce, it was regulating what you could wear, where you could go, your wages, <laughs> everything. And then people didn't like the decisions sometimes, so they challenged them. And this was the regulatory state, and they challenged them, it led to the case law. So, just in that sense, just if you're looking, I, mean, I, I accept entirely that the organization and systematization of material through a, a text is of some significance. But I, my own view is that it's putting the cart before the horse to say that that's the criteria as to whether the subject actually is. You're, 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 you interrupted me by misunderstanding me, but you did well because, <laughs> you, because you give me the opportunity to explain myself. First of all, I believe that it is a, 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 an undisputed truth that uh, administrative law as reality is in every country the equally old. It's not that in one country developed uh, first or in another country developed a uh, uh, second. But it developed differently and, it, and the subject matter was discovered or systematized differently. So, uh, as soon as you had public powers, it is necessary to accept that you had also litigation about the exercise of public powers. So there, I don't disagree with you. And I'm sorry that I made myself uh, uncertain. What I said is that in France, uh, of which uh, uh, we've been talking um, a lot uh, in this, around this table, in France, the first time a book systematizes administrative law is when Edouard Laferriere, a vice president du Conseil d'État, writes a book. It was uh, 1890, I think, something like yeah. that. Something like that. Writes a book, Traité de Contentieux Administratif, Treaty of Judicial Review of Administrative Action. He does not call it administrative law. So for him, judicial review of administrative action and administrative law coincide. Mm -hmm. That's the book. Now, why he wrote the book? Because in 1873, the Tribunal de Conflict had taken a decision called Are Blanco. Uh, Are Blanco said that uh, this is litigation of public law and it goes necessarily to the Conseil d'État. La compétence suit le fond. You are competent because of uh, substance. the substance of the case. Competences uh, determined by the substance of the case. So, and so it develops, and he is able to write a book on public law because now it is recognized that it exists. What happened in this country? In this country, the word administrative law was banned because of A.B. Dicey. So the Smith has done the foundation of administrative law, as everyone would respectfully say. First of all, because of this Penguin book, eh? Constitutional Law, Constitutional and Administrative Law, but mainly because of Judicial Review of Administrative Action. When I read for the first time the Judicial Review of Administrative uh, Action, I said, the Laferriere of England. The same thing. 
Now, this determines in this country the idea of La Ferrière in that country of what administrative law is, which is the litigation. Now, you come to uh, your time. It was 81, I think, when you published your book. And uh, it, it was uh, in uh, uh, 78 or 79, the O'Reilly versus McMahon. It was uh, one or two Se years. 79. 79. 79. Yeah. 79 in the House of Lords. What, di what did uh, the, uh, that O'Reilly versus McMahon say? He said, the competence to ILFO. The competence is determined by the content of the case, and this content of the case goes exclusively. I believe it was a wrong decision, but anyway, they said it, was, it, it goes exclusively to the public law procedure. So you could now, you were able in this country to advance. You had a procedure of your own. You had, but uh, up to today, you continue understanding the administrative law as traité de contentieux administratif. That was that what I was trying to say, and I think it is about time, and I think you have done it already. Well, it I is a, can, can I just carry on? Because I, 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 I think it's possibly a bit more complicated even than that. Because but one of the things that, that, that affected the way it developed was that until the, as it then was, you, Order 53 in the application of judicial review procedure, the, the way it tended to develop was by reference to remedies. And th there was certainly a great deal of more or less systematized learning about each of what were then the prerogative writs. There were books written about each of the prerogative writs in the 19th century, saying, you know, here's where yeah. who can apply for them, here's how you get them, here what the rules of standing rules were, all the rest of it. And because of that concentration on the, uh, on the remedies of what we now call judicial review for administrative action, um, lawyers tended, I think, to think in, in, in those silos rather than by looking, at, looking for uh, substantive principles which, which cut across them. That wasn't helped, admittedly by the fact that the teaching of English law was practice-based at that stage. We had uh, uh, English law being taught at UCL from the early 19th century. The Fidelian chair of Oxford, late 18th century, the period fell into dissuitude almost until Dicey took it up again in the, uh, in, the, in the 1880s. Um, and the teaching of English law here didn't really get off the ground until, <coughs> well, we had a, a, a professional of the laws of England from 1807, but, the, but nothing very significant happened until much later. So that there was, that there was no very systematic university-based teaching or scholarship of English law generally or public law in particular. And um, I, I think it's uh, not insignificant that the title of, of Dice's inaugural lecture in the Bilearian Chair was something like um, Can English Law Be Taught in Universities? <laughs> uh, all the teaching happened at, at the Inns of Court, the, uh, through the solicitors, through articles, and then private tutors like Gibson Weldon. So th th there was, it, it was a practice based yeah. body of learning, and um, it, it was only relatively late that people like us came along and started trying to systematize this in terms of general substantive principles. Um, and, and that itself is important because I think that's a very different 
intellectual history of legal scholarship from the one that you'll find in just about any of the civil law countries. So the reason that, that, that it was the 1970s that, that it, it took off uh, as, as a subject was that we had had people like um, Wade and De Smith and before that uh, uh, Jennings, I suppose, Griffith and Street and so on, coming along and saying, well, the, the public law is something which is, is, is worth thinking about as, as a subject. And then uh, Ted Mitchell from there. And even interesting to land rather decisions. I mean, in, in uh, Richard Baldwin, uh, uh, Stephen Bailey pointed out recently in, in, in a piece on Richard Baldwin. Uh, Rich, having lost in the Court of Appeal, changed the city council, got Desmond Ackner, uh, and Desmond Ackner went to Wade, and Wade said, well, here are all these 19th century authorities which you could build on for, you know, for, for, the, for the, the scope of natural justice and the circumstances in which natural justice applies. And then he got, as a broad, beginning to systematise it, and, 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 and to, a great, to a great extent, and to really, was also, uh, to a surprising extent, orchestrated by Bill Wade. Um, so, now, I would like just to complete what uh, Spiro uh, said about the French system. Uh, it's true, uh, as I told uh, this morning, uh, there was uh, a Conseil d'État dealing with uh, a judicial review of administrative action under the reign of Louis XIV. So, it, in that sense. They were an administrative law uh, uh, since uh, uh, a very long time. But I do agree with what you said. Uh, the administrative law as a system uh, was uh, created at the end of the 19th century by the Conseil d'État, uh, uh, in fact, to define its own competencies. But uh, the irony of the uh, situation is that uh, it, it's no more true because we cannot say today that la compétence suit le fond, uh, it's over since uh, the mid-90s and especially the case Lyon et Marais, uh, uh, because the administrative judge is now uh, dealing with uh, administrative law but also uh, criminal law, uh, civil law and, and so on. Uh, so uh, now there is a, a disconnection uh, between administrative law and administrative justice. So it, it's a, a kind of a, a change uh, uh, of uh, uh, nowadays period. Well, if I may, uh, this is uh, the uh, advantage of uh, French administrative law. Uh, unlike uh, Germany or uh, Greece, uh, where there is constitutional division in Germany, we, we, we copied you uh, on this and uh, we uh, provided in the constitution the field of, comp of competence mm -hmm. of every jurisdiction, as a, a civil and criminal, uh, administrative, court de compte, uh, conseil d'état, etc. But in, in your case, this uh, is done by law. And, uh, and, uh, and I believe this is one of the advantages of your system, that uh, while the truth is that the administrative law developed on the basis la compétence sur le fond, mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, you can be sure that something is in the competence of the Conseil d'État only because the law says so. And uh, actually, this is my position for what concerns your, uh, 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 your um, uh, case law on uh, the travaux public, on the, on the uh, because uh, everybody around the world believes that you uh, do uh, uh, that you have jurisdiction on the travaux public because of the so-called uh, um, clause exorbitant, etc. But I believe that you have jurisdiction only because the law says so, and the clause exorbitant you use it negatively to deny when you want to deny uh, 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 um, competence or, or on a certain contract. But it is a very, very interesting point. But on, on the travaux public, you are totally right, because this is the law of the huit years en huit no, no, no. <laughs> that, that give competences. In it's fact, the there is the law, but 
most of the time, uh, the division of competencies is doing by the case law of the tribunal des conflits. Uh, and, and so this is... Uh, yeah, but, but there is a law. For yeah, for, for the travel public, yes. <laughs> but this being said, it gives me the opportunity to, to conclude what I want to say. That, the, that the, if you look, not historically, the systems, but uh, horizontally, the, the most improved system of recourse to justice today that I know of is the English one. Because you have the um, judicial review for administrative action, you, and then you can ask for five remedies uh, and two uh, uh, writs of uh, civil law, I think. It's, uh, well, that five it's five, five remedies, yeah, five five. In, included in the five, yeah. And y so you can go to court mm -hmm. and then during, you can ask at the same time for more remedies and then during the procedure you can change. You are much more flexible than it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a lesson to take from oh, that. Well, I, 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 would, I would caution against <laughs> So, at the level of systematization, 
of the review process, yes, I, I, I agree we've, we've come quite a long way, but at the level of quality of administrative justice, that doesn't seem to be true at all. And what is your explanation for that? That uh, be, is, there, is there also something that if you don't really have a clear public law branch and, and public administration trained lawyers, that it's hard to make your case law be implemented within the administration, or is there a totally different explanation to that? Well, I know <laughs> others may have a different view, but it seems to me that the part of the problem is that uh, because of, partly because of the way that judicial review is developed and has been located in independent <coughs> courts which often don't seem to have much idea about what public administration actually involves. The reaction of the administration to judicial decisions is at best one of grudging compliance mm -hmm. and not enthusiastic cooperation. So what they tend to do is, is they, they make an adverse decision. First of all, the adverse decision will relate to a particular area of public administration. It's got to be very, very significant indeed if that's going to be picked up for its implications in other areas of mm. public administration. The, 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 the um, the way in which the government legal service is organised now is, is that there are in house lawyers in each of the departments who don't necessarily talk to each other, so they know about cases they win and lose in their own uh, back garden, but they don't know necessarily about what's going on in other areas. Um, and the, uh, the reaction of administrators uh, to this is how can we avoid being caught out again, rather than how can we improve the administration so that the problem mm. doesn't arise? Um, and questions of judicial reviewability tend to get left in the decision-making process. They're not a central part of the decision-making process. They, they make their decisions and then wait to see whether anyone challenges it. Often, if it is challenged, then immediately there will be an administrative review, and the administrative review will be the decision being changed. But if not, then you just go on and on and on, hand it over to the lawyers, and the local lawyers get on with it, and we get on with the administration. And that's just part of our, uh, of, 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 of the historic relationship between the judicial review process and the court to help them to pay a counselor or 
Because in, in France, in the immigration field, most of the time, uh, this is uh, in fact uh, the, the public uh, uh, service of uh, you know uh, what we call assistant judiciaire, mm -hmm. who provides uh, a, a lawyer to to, to those uh, applicants. Well, that's been cut right back, and it's been cut back in two ways. One is by cutting the amount of money that's available for it. The other is that in an increasing number of types of immigration case, you're not allowed to appeal from inside the country. No. You, you're, you're required to leave the country and then appeal from outside. Okay. Which, of course, cuts you off <laughs> to a large yeah. extent for, for any support which you might have had for, for any public. Even in the asylum uh, area? So is, 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 a, is a different matter, but what, what has happened there is a series of, of pieces of legislation which have allowed ministers, usually Home Office mm -hmm. ministers, um, to certify that the human rights claim or the asylum claim has no hope of success. I, 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 and, and they decide it has no hope of success in the first instance. You can go and try to get judicial review of the certif certificate from the minister that says we dismiss this claim because it has no hope of success, but it's very unusual to persuade the courts okay. that the minister's judgment on that point is, is, uh, is, 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 is to be quashed. So it's, it's a very unhappy position, which is, I'm afraid has been made worse by the increasingly xenophobic attitude of the service since the banks mm. Also in Dutch administrative law, the British asylum cases are the most cited cases. They are really setting the standard for how strict reviews should be. Yes. So <laughs> well, that, that, if, you, if you get cases up to Sometimes court of appeal at the Supreme Court level, there are some very good things being done. Uh, uh, there, there are cases about uh, deporting foreign prisoners, for example, which are, which are really rather good. But if you look at the day to day, this mm -hmm. is down yeah. uh, at the basic level, and, and some idea of the uh, of the weakness of the decision-making system is that when, when, when cases do get into the first-tier tribunals, um, the success rate for applicants is, it varies a bit between the type of case between 60 and 90 percent. So there's a real, a real problem. Mm. If I may. Uh, concerning what you said uh, about uh, uh, the uh, this difference between uh, our historical system <coughs> and uh, your uh, judicial view of administrative action and the possibility to change and uh, uh, what you ask for and if this is good or bad, I need to uh, to warn you that in Greece, uh, if you take uh, if you ask for the wrong remedy you may need 10 years to be able to, uh, uh, to uh, go back to the good, to the right remedy. Because you may need to have a first instant, uh, instance uh, court decision, second instance court decision, and the custom state, to, uh, state so that you understand that uh, you took the wrong path and you, you should have done something else. But with you, you can go flexibly up. And uh, because I have this experience, I believe that uh, it very often the new systems have uh, a fresh answers to, to problems which the historical systems have been very accustomed with so much that they don't understand that they need change. And um, uh, that's why I, uh, uh, I brought this, uh, uh, this uh, qu uh, question up. As for the specialization of the judge, uh, 
I am personally convinced that in this country, the same as in uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, there will be more and more specialization. And if I'm not wrong, you are, I, I, I cannot be sure when I'm talking to a common lawyer so famous and uh, distinguished uh, uh, level, uh, they are or, already advanced. Uh, 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 I mean, more advanced into specializing. And uh, I will ask uh, our friend uh, uh, Luis Maria about Spain. Well, the, the, uh, if I understand it well, you have a common jurisdiction, but with specialized divisions. Yes. Can you explain to us the system? Now, um, the short answer is yes. <laughs> and the devil is in the nuances. <laughs> now, <clears throat> uh, the short answer is yes in the sense that our system of uh, administrative courts it belongs to the judicial power. So we all are ordinary judges with the, exactly the same status, the same rights, uh, the same duties, the same guarantees of independence, the same uh, ways of selection and access to the judiciary and so on. So administrative judges are judges. We are all subordinated to the National Council of the Judiciary and so on. The different, there are basically four lines of uh, courts, civil, criminal, administrative and social, all of them served by true judges. And in the Supreme Court there are four chambers, the first is civil, the second criminal, the third administrative and the fourth social. Now, having said that, that, does that mean that uh, judges that serve in administrative courts, including the third chamber, which is the, the supreme judicial body in the field, are all of them uh, specialized, substantially, uh, that they uh, have been recruited because of their specialization in administrative law? Yes and no. The, uh, the law on the um, on the uh, on, on judicial review of administrative action, the, the law governing the, the administrative process before the, the administrative course of 1956 did something which was very important, namely to introduce a second public examination, a second public competition for people who were already judges and wanted to become specialized in uh, administrative law. And after 60 years, that has produced a within uh, judges serving the uh, administrative courts a group of real specialists. And they have uh, pulled uh, from, from the others. But probably more than half judges in all levels that serve in administrative courts, including my chamber, I, uh, do not come from uh, uh, this second public uh, competition. So they, uh, when they first arrived at an administrative court, they were the name like, like the English ones. So they <coughs> made their expertise on, on the field. They came from civil or criminal courts, uh, lower uh, civil or criminal courts, and at a certain stage, basically, because of uh, seniority, they had the right to ask for a place in a court, uh, court of appeal and uh, a regional court of appeal. And there happened to be a vacancy <laughs> in, the, in, the, cha in the, the administrative chamber, and they asked for it. So perhaps more than half, in, in any event, at least half, the judges in all levels, in all three levels, of uh, administrative courts, including my chamber, uh, are people that have only won one, the, the, the origin, uh, public uh, competition, and they have done their specialization uh, battling on the field and not studying on uh, books. So, so that's, having said that, it is true that we have spe ordinary courts specialized for administrative business, it is also true that for the last 60 years at least, we have uh, had uh, an important uh, uh, number of judges <coughs> that have done their specialization by winning 
a second, a second competition, being already judges. So in, in their 30s or early 40s and studying while working with, with no leave of absence. So that's, uh, that is, and that has had an extremely positive <coughs> effect because those who are not formally uh, specialists know that they have to sit to, to debate with a uh, specialist. So they have to, to prepare, to be prepared for that. And what is their origin? I mean, do they come from a, a, their initiation? Do you have a career system like in France? Uh, the, the Spanish system is a career system, a, a typical career system. Most, uh, I, I, Thomas uh, asked me uh, about that. Uh, so it is, it's a typically career system in the sense that uh, most judges uh, arrive at the judiciary through a public competition when they are relatively young, in their late 20s usually, and they, most of them uh, do the, the, the whole of their careers in the judiciary following the Cour Honor. Since 1985, we have a collateral access for, uh, uh, and they use, and they, when, once they are uh, admitted, without, with a public competition, but it is not a true examination. It's a, a, a they, the, the curriculum is, is, uh, is uh, analyzed. So, and that is, the, the, those, the, the, the requirement is that they should be lawyers with at least 10 years experience. And if they are admitted, they, arrive, they uh, get into the judiciary at a, an intermediate level. And lastly, there is the, the way I, I arrived at the judiciary. It has been in existence since uh, 1870. And it is that one-fifth, 20% of the positions at the Supreme Court in all fields, civil, criminal, administrative, and social, are, uh, are announced for lawyers that previously did not belong to the judiciary. For law professors, uh, public prosecutors, practicing lawyers, with a, a, certain, uh, a certain seniority. So, and uh, so the, these are the three uh, but it basically, it's a, 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 a career system. I'm inclined to think it wants flagging. Is that a fair assessment? In which case, what I'd like to do is to, um, first of all, to conclude this part of the proceedings by thanking all of you very much coming and thanking um, Wolfson for the organisation of the facilities and the, the uh, food that we've had and that we hope to have again later <laughs> uh, and so on. Um, and to, to thank particularly two pairs of people, one is Alessia and Spiros for the huge amount of work.
The second influence is the idea of uh, Charles de Gaulle from France. And the third influence, this is the strong cooperation on the education field which we created with the European Public Law Organization and especially with Dr. Karkalis during the last four years with the short-term uh, study programs for the students. So, and this idea is to make uh, uh, one special round of European legal dialogues and make it <coughs> in the whole European space. Uh, why Charles de Gaulle? Why France? Because it's the idea of uh, Europe from Lisbon to Europe. Uh, to create a platform for the students and speakers where they can meet each other to discuss the different fields of law cases or law directions. So European legal dialects from Lisbon to, you can say, to Euros, to Vladivostok, to, I don't know, somewhere. How from from east to west. Russia to <laughs> We, we can take in China uh, after your negotiations in Kazakhstan and Kazakhstan. So, uh, the idea is that <coughs> it can be a conference or forum for two or three days where we can make a, a plenary discussion for one general legal problem that we can uh, discuss together, which one it will be, and then different panels well, uh, on the interests, we can discuss administrative law, uh, international law, environment law, and so on. And it will be for two or three days. Students, because we have more than 70 universities in the European Public Organization, it means that we can announce for the students of this program, they can participate in the discussions and after these two or three days, they can uh, live for a short campus where the speakers of the conference can provide master classes for them. It means that in five or seven days, we can have together and speakers and students from whole group. And as the first idea, we can do it because I can propose it uh, with this idea in. Uh, in Kaliningrad, because we have a campus here, huge and new campus, where we can accept students, and it's close to all European places, and we can do it next uh, next year, for example. But together, thinking about the subjects, what we want to discuss from different fields, and to to make it actually into university campus. European public organization with these ideas. Thank you. The five past experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. On another subject. Well, I, I, I just going to say that I think that's a very constructive suggestion and one which we will uh, be keen to take forward. And, and, uh, we can discuss it by email um, in the coming weeks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the floor, uh, David. Uh, I wanted not uh, to miss the opportunity to thank you uh, personally. <laughs> you are Cambridge, and uh, you are truly the most hospitable person that uh, I uh, know of. And uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, all the support which uh, you uh, are providing to this, uh, uh, to making this happen. Uh, let us not forget that uh, uh, the Center for Public Law, of which you are director, this year is contributing uh, in the sponsoring of this uh, event, and uh, uh, this is a great uh, help into. Uh, advancing uh, this idea. I believe uh, that uh, nothing could be done without you and I remember that we developed this idea <coughs> in our discussions together a couple of years ago also along with uh, uh, Sir John Laws, 
whom uh, we all uh, thank, uh, not only for uh, the heroic attitude uh, he had uh, a year ago, when uh, he had uh, he decided uh, uh, to sit and preside under dramatic for him circumstances, uh, this uh, the launching of this event, and he did it so gracefully and so skillfully, and um, uh, our uh, so our uh, uh, our uh, our thinking goes to him now. Uh, because uh, he could not make it and join us today uh, and uh, preside uh, this uh, session. Let us hope, and I know that we share the same uh, uh, hope and wish, uh, that uh, uh, he will be sitting there next uh, uh, year and, um, and uh, he will um, uh, help advancing uh, this concept uh, and uh, uh, once more, thank you for everything that you are doing for a common purpose. Sorry. Thank you.